team will come to order. Please rise to the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Item on our agenda is approval of minutes for April 23rd, 2019. Is there a motion? Second. Been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Three zero. Approval of the warrant. So moved. Second. Um, do we have to do anything? No, because we have a majority or a stand to approve All right. Um, so moved and seconded. Any question, comment? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Abstain. Abstain. So, two, zero, one. Public participation. Is there anyone here to talk about anything that is not on the agenda? Come on up. Hi, would you introduce yourself and um, tell us why you're here? Hi. My name is Liz DiTucci. I'm a parent of a kindergartner and a second grader at Fox Hill. My name is Janelle Linsky. I have a second grader at Fox Hill, um, two incoming kindergartners, and also a student at preschool. So um, we've had some email back and forth with Principal Rosenblatt and um, Dr. Crosby about class sizes, and I know I included the school committee on it as well, mm -hmm. but I just wanted to give you um, my perspective because I'm here, I mean, I am totally here not to complain. I'm a fan, I'm a huge fan of Fox Hill. Um, teachers are amazing, and we've had a really great experience with the principal this year. He's extremely present, um, so it's been really good. So I'm here um, just seeing if we can fix a problem that I think is pretty, um, I think there's a short-term problem with uh, students per classroom, but I think based on what I'm starting to see data from you guys that it's going to continue this way. So I'm kind of, I mean, I definitely know there needs to be a longer term plan, um, but I'm very concerned short term about what's going on now. Um, so here's, just here's some data. So my current second grader at Fox Hill, so when she was in kindergarten, there were 17 students, including her, in her class. In first grade, there were also, um, it started as 17 and then it became 16 because one moved. She is now in second grade and there are 22 students in her classroom now. I've traded emails with Dr. Conti, and when you guys give me your projections, um, the number looks a little smaller. So you guys have it as 19.75 as the average class size, but um, I think the difference is, because I mean, I volunteer in the class and there's 22 kids in the classroom, they're shoved in there. Um, so it does include lab students, which I think should be included. I think it's great to have everybody in the classroom, and I think those numbers should be included when we talk about the class size. Um, so my ask, to be really specific, is, that, and let me give more background. So when these students moved from first to second grade, um, very quietly a classroom was reduced. So we didn't, as parents, we didn't find out about this until everybody was seeing what teacher you had for next year, and we realized there were only four classrooms, not five. So um, possibly a communication issue from the former people in charge of Fox Hill. I'm not here to place blame or figure it out. It's just that it happened really quietly. So it's not consistent across elementary schools because what I understand is that, for example, Francis Wyman, you don't reduce a classroom until these children go to third grade. So Currently, those second graders still have their additional classroom, and there's discussion to remove it next year when they go to third grade. I'm here to also say I support the Francis Wyman parents, and I believe <coughs> to keep classroom sizes small, that that classroom should remain at that school as well. Um, so my specific ask is um, that you add back in that classroom and teacher to the current Fox Hill second grade students as they go to third, and that that remains with them through their elementary school so that they don't balloon back up to 22 or more students. Um, and then if I start to look at the numbers um, and projections, so my current kindergartner um, 
have started the year with 19 students and one student moved, so they're down to 18. However, if, if the same thing happens to that grade, that grade's even bigger. If the same thing happens to that grade at Fox Hill, if you remove the classroom at second grade, they're gonna go up to 22 students without any additional students who come in and out of the classroom. So it's gonna go, I mean, I'm very used to in Burlington hearing from you guys that small classroom sizes are important. I mean, unless we're gonna talk about a security thing, I think that's one of the most important things to prioritize when we look at budgets. And so that's my ask. Um, I know Dr. Conti mentioned Fox Hill is looking at maybe an additional guidance counselor and an additional homeroom teacher, but I've also heard that will go to fifth grade. Um, so I, I would like to see this be figured out within the budget above and beyond. I don't want to see anybody else lose out or reduce to, you know, accommodate these kids going to third, but um, I just think I'm starting to become concerned, and so I just wanted to come here to be part of the solution. Okay. Um, do you have any comments? Um, sure. I, we, we've actually, <laughs> I've been communicated a lot. So mm -hmm. I printed, um, I left them at your desk, and just to teach you, I'm just, these are black and white, so it might be a little bit hard to read, but I asked Robin Miliano, our student information person, just to print what's latest, and I think we're probably going to have the same conversation and look at the lab. Um, stuff later. Does anyone else have anything to say on this issue? Um, my concerns are the same as Liz's, um, and, you know, I just... Part of the reason why my family decided to move to Burlington several years ago when my daughter was entering kindergarten was because of the reputations of the schools and the small class sizes. So I was very disappointed to hear that one of the classes was cut and that that tends to be something that does happen as kids are in second, third grade or they move on um, with three more kids about to come through the school system. I'm hoping that you know that can change so that the classes can stay under 20 for all of my kids that still have school to attend. That's certainly our goal. Um, we have limited space and we have limited funding for teachers, but I think Dr. Conti works pretty hard to do the best he can. So, um, you want to comment or? No, I, I can. I, I can certainly comment. I, I'm not going to um, disagree with the sentiment. I, I think we are starting to see class sizes get a little larger. We, we have some classes that have bulges that can't yeah. um, control when families are happening. Um, and I just want to make sure that we sort of in general say I think we have very good class sizes uh, across the district. We just have some grades where um, we're starting to see us creep over 20. Um, that's one factor, um, but as you all know, we're also running out of classrooms. So at some point, we may not be able to add teachers then without displacing um, um, other uh, specials or, or things like that, and, and I know the, the school committee knows that. So um, my understanding with Fox Hill, and we can talk about a, any school you want, obviously they, we have a, uh, a bulge at uh, grade three at Francis Wyman. So this is next year, excuse this me? This is, yeah, I moved okay. everyone up a year, so this is a, a cohort, so um, it wouldn't be, um, Mr. Tucci, I think you said your daughter's currently in second? I have a kindergartner and a second grader, the two big ones. R right, right now, correct? Correct. So what you're looking at would be that First second grade, that second grade up at third grade. Yep. So, so, um, and so we moved anyone up. So the, the uh, incoming K classes um, are usually the most um, unpredictable. That's why we try to get everyone registered early. Um, and there's always some discrepancy between um, who's identified uh, from the town through Aspen and who's actually registered. That's why you see the difference between Aspen as our student management system and True as who's actually come in and physically registered. Um, the um, last year we had five in K and we're taking that fifth up. So the fifth section is following the students from mm -hmm. K to one. Um, and then um, we had, um, I believe three and five Right? There's only three fifth grade teachers this year because there's a class of 50 that's moving up. It's a small fifth grade. Um, and we're going to put a, um, a fourth. Um, so again, Fox Hill is going to go from 24, I'm saying homeroom teachers, classroom teachers, to 25 um, next year. 
What you were saying is you would also like there to be, because there were five in currently in grade two, is that? They were, they had five classrooms when they, for kindergarten in one, and then you cut it um, from one to two. From five to four? Correct. Yes. Yeah. A year ago. A year ago. Mm -hmm. So then, so then we're seeing you're seeing the 20 and 21 in grade three for next year, and your concern is we're over 20. Um, plus, when the lab students are included, you said a classroom can then have 22. Um, and my stu my child's class has 22. Has 22. Yep. Um, so I'm saying I think that would sort of bear out. I'm looking at averages. I'm not sure where every student is assigned. So there may be a class of 19 mm -hmm. and a class of uh, and a class of 22. Um, in so there. if it's budget and space, that's what two issues, right? Right. So, I mean, the if it's budget, I see it as a prioritization issue. To for me, this is again like other than security of the school, this is the top priority from my perspective. I don't do your job. I don't know everything, but you know, I know the budget was just approved last night. But I see this as something where you know money should be shifted. To accommodate this and then if it's a space issue which i totally get because you're out of classrooms at fox hill but look into renting you know additional portables or something because i mean this you're not gonna have a, if you need to build a building or if you need to do something capital you're not gonna have a solution to that in the next what five six years but i mean this is a problem now and these grades are big now and i don't know what you know the younger kids look like but what are we doing now? And I've, I mean, I've heard this from other parents and teachers. Um, I think what we have to do is keep going on our planning for next year and see what, what works out. Um, I, I totally understand your concern. Anything over 20 bothers me too, although contractually we have an upper limit of, I believe it's 26. Is that right, Diana? I think it's about right. About 26. We have one yet. So these class sizes, even though they seem large to you based on our history, they're still not too bad. But we get it, and we, we really don't want them over 18. So as the, as the time goes on in the next month or two, I think Dr. Conti and the principal at Fox Hill will figure out the best they can do. And, um, I, yeah, I mean, there's only a month left until basically report cards. And, and then we don't know if kids are going to move in over the summer. I mean, that that has happened in the past, and that's caused dramatic changes as well. You know, with kids could move out, and the size would be smaller. Kids could move in, and we, you know, we'd have to go to town meeting and say we need another teacher. Mm -hmm. you know, um, but is I mean, I'm sorry to harp on it, but because I feel passionately about mm -hmm. it, but is there a way to reprioritize? Um, the way you've done the budget in order to accommodate this? Sure, um, but again, that might mean we don't, we put off the guidance counselor for a year and we put another classroom teacher in so we could trade the salary. It yeah, could be that we're going from, we well, that's a reprioritization. So it could be that we go from five, when we went from four K, five Ks to four Ks next year, we have an instructional assistant that's attached to the, the K that maybe we move the instructional assistant to grade three to, to sort of assist. Um, with a class of 22, but at some point it's just a matter of bodies in the room. So again, David and I can have those type of conversations. Um, if we add a teacher at Fox Hill, um, then we're really going to need to add a teacher at um, Francis Wyman as well. So we would need to go from, again, 96, I'm saying sort of homeroom classroom teachers, there's many more teachers in the building, district-wide, we would probably need to go to um, um, 98. Again, we have... Um, four additional teaching positions in the budget, um, and um, again, we could rethink those four positions, but uh, that's, you know, that's where we're at. We, we could also, again, um, we have three currently grade five at Fox Hill, and we could have classes of, uh, larger classes at grade five, and that section could be moved down to uh, grade three, so um, again, Usually, um, we try to get as many sort of teachers in the budget as we can, and then there's a lot of conversations at the school, depending on the class and sort of what's going on with the personality. So we do have some options. I don't think we're without options, but it's it's rarely just an additive option. So um, 
that's going to require additional funding or cuts somewhere else, um, just because we're pretty tightly budgeted now. Um, and um, and again, but I'm, I'm not arguing your point. Mm -hmm. Class sizes are sort of getting up. I'd be more comfortable if they were uh, under 20. I think that, that certainly um, helps. Um, I believe in the inclusion that we're trying to um, make happen as well. I don't think anyone's saying anything negative about that. And I think our teachers at Fox Hill are great and going to do a great job um, um, with the classes that we provide them. So. Um, I'm not trying to give you a definitive answer tonight, but I can certainly uh, look at uh, grade three at Fox Hill, because I think I'm just going to highlight that. It looks like we're um, OK everywhere else. Um, I do believe we could create a classroom space if we had to. I spoke to um, David about that. We might have to displace some people, so it's not there. But I just don't think we can address um, grade three at Fox Hill without looking at grade three Francis at um, one. Francis one. I just I just want to follow up on the on the space issue. Um, in the past, we have gone the the portable route. Obviously, if you've been in town, you know that. Um, but that's not an easy thing to do either. That's certainly, it's, you can't just call up and order a couple of portables. It's a that's a process. So um, these types of things, these issues on on a short term basis, are, are difficult to solve. Uh, long term, they're a little bit easier when you can uh, prepare for them. Because um, <clears throat> you're right, if, if a, a new building, if we're four or five years out, even if we get approvals tomorrow on that. So, um, and we've started talking about potentially having to, to do something in the interim and, and, and looking into that. And if that's a rule, you know, they're expensive and, you know, Money, money is an issue, so that's something we'd have to look at. But if portables is a short-term solution, the likelihood of having those in place by, by the fall is a nil. But we could certainly, if that's a short-term route that we're going to have to go until we get new buildings in place, um, we'll ask, we'd have to have those discussions and maybe get something in place for next year. Mm -hmm. So. It, it, it's such an inexact science. People move in, people move out. Um, you know, you look down this list here. There are some some classes that are 15 and 16, and others are 21 and 20. Um, it's you know, you never know who's going to move into what street, mm -hmm. what district they're going to be in, and what grades their kids are going to be. In. And so you do the best you can, but it's it's never well. They're 14, so we want to be 14. There's just a lot of it goes into it. So. Um, as Dr. Conti says, we're aware of the situation and we're doing the best we can um, to deal with it as best we can. Um, that doesn't mean that come September, everybody's going to be thrilled with, with their situations. Um, you know, if we if we brought Peter to pay Paul, then um, Peter's mad. So you know. yeah, and I mean, I heard you say something about fifth grade. I wouldn't <clears throat> want to see them their classroom size go up either. Um, but it sounds like there's so in terms of next steps, it sounds like you're talking to Principal Rosenblatt, and we'll hear back from you in like what sort of time frame? Um, yeah, because again, I, I would, in my head, and I guess looking at, you know, I think what's best practice is if this were a conversation between sort of K2, um, 3, 5, I would rather have the 2021 with fifth graders than I would with first graders. So um, again, I think um, there's some aspects of Sophie's choice to this, but I, I do want to make sure that I'm framing that s some, <laughs> um, in many places, 21 and 22 are fantastic. And again, I don't want to say that that's not what people here are used to. And I'm, again, I don't want to argue that point, but it may be something that we look at where um, Again, we can look at the the grade. I think the what you have in front of you is just honestly a model that we are going through for budgeting purposes because I have to make sure we can um, pay for the teachers that we have on staff. So this is one potential model. We can certainly look to do some shifting around. Um, but if there sort of if there is a real priority put to the class sizes that you're seeking, it's typically with the younger um, the younger grades is is what I would say as practice in general. Um, um, 
the budget was approved what last night I think we still have the rest of town meeting to get through um, I'm assuming the next couple weeks this is going to have to get resolved because we're going to start um, posting and moving people around and so we can um, I don't think it's going to be much longer than that okay that and then how do we like medium term how do we ensure that um, this is a topic for your discussions to make sure that when the budgeting process starts like if you do need space or portable classrooms or an ask for teachers um, how do we just as people coming here for public participation how do we ensure that that stays on your radar pay attention in the fall okay. <laughs> when, the, when we get into the guidelines setting mm -hmm. and that's Go ahead. The chair is one of the points that you know it's it's appreciative to have not just the emails but to have you come to the meeting because we do have the Ways and Means Board here and as we move forward and we we look to next fall's budget if we're advocating for another teacher we get a lot of pushback. Your your numbers are fantastic, but. Um, it's different when you're looking at numbers when versus standing in the classroom teaching a first grader the difference between the letter P and the letter D. You know, having less children as you're teaching them to write at those lower grades is just huge. So, you know, Dr. Conti's point, um, I also favor if we need to shuffle around 22, 21 at a fifth grade level is a little more manageable than having 22, 21 at that uh, first, second grade level when they're really, you know, more needy and, and need more direct instruction. So, but this coming here is is excellent because again we have the ways and means. It's televised. And when we go to the the town um, selectman and and town administrator and we're trying to advocate, you know, it helps that they understand what the, the parents are seeing also and what, what your priorities are too. So. so thank you for bringing your concerns to us. Um, I'm sure you'll keep the communication up with Dr. Conti and mm -hmm. we'll see where this goes in the next few weeks. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Is there anyone else here for public participation on a topic not on the agenda? <coughs> Okay, moving on. The next item on our agenda, information and reports, student representative. Hi everyone, hope you guys are having a great day in this rainy weather. Um, so this week is our last week as interns on our internship, which is really sad because I've gotten to know many of the teachers and lab students that I've worked with, and I think everyone on the internship has gotten a lot of experience out of this wonderful opportunity that we've been given. Um, also, um, in our student government, we have elected a new SCAB member, and his name is Arya Nagraj. He wasn't able to be here today because he had an AP test tomorrow. <coughs> and he has also been elected on our student council in the state leadership, which I was also a part of. So he will be representing Burlington and Malden at DESE next year. And then also, in other news, we had our prom last Friday, and it was actually a very wonderful <coughs> experience, and everyone loved everything about it. The food, the venue, the DJ, just a lot of dancing. What's the venue? The venue was Doubletree in Danvers. It's oh. the Coco Keys Hotel. So. Oh. Mm -hmm. It was called the Fern Crop. The yeah. old Fern Crop. The old Fern Crop. <laughs> Thank you. Is that it? Yep. Anyone have any, any comments or questions? Will you be joining us at the, our next meeting in June? Or will um, we, in May. Or will you? May. I will. Oh, okay. Yeah, right. Right. Great. Great. I'm just questioning the priorities of our new SCAD member. <laughs> it should be here. <laughs> AP test. Hey, uh, AP uh, test. Uh, AP, which one is it, do you know? AP World. Oh, All right. Terrible. All right. <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you for all of your time and I really like being a part of this board. You've been a delight. Mm -hmm. you really thank you. Say hi to your brother for me. I will. Uh, any subcommittee uh, reports? <coughs> no. Moving on, what it means? Not a thing. Actually, I do have one. Okay, go ahead. Uh, from the rec, 
Um, we, uh, you would, I think that you would have forwarded a, an email from a couple yes. of Francis Wyman parents about the condition of the playground yes. down there. And a uh, rec commissioner, Kevin Sullivan, um, met down at the playground with the two parents and with um, Brendan Egan and identified areas that needed attention and the, um, the rec uh, maintenance staff will do what they can with the items that they identified. But um, there were some other things that, and I, I haven't seen them yet, but Kevin was telling me about them, that might need further attention, either um, uh, removing them or, or <coughs> replacing them with, with things to that effect, which, um, when you get to that point, uh, funding becomes an issue as well. So um, I just wanted to give everybody a heads up that uh, the rec's looking into it. Uh, there are some short-term things that they're going to do through their staff. There might be some longer-term things that they might want to talk to us about. This playground down there is the one that was essentially um, purchased through a, a, a group of parents probably 15 years ago now, uh, maybe even longer. So it's, um, it's, it's getting to the point where it needs some attention. And, uh, I, th I think the rec is obviously willing to, to do what they can. They might be looking to work with us on some of this one. Um, Madam Chair, again, Bob attended that meeting, so I think he heard directly from the, the parents and Brendan, so I think we're going to probably... Got anything to add, Bobby? Um, not really to add, but really just to confirm what Tom said. So uh, because some of the conditions of the sandbox, the gazebo and so forth are 15 years old, I mean, our maintenance department and the right department has done some upkeep to them, um, but we are looking at, you know, potential where that a time where we kind of either need to replace them or do something more than just sand and paint them. Um, some of the other conditions that we're talking about is the slide that's in place and there's a hill going down to the playground that has bushes in them um, that has some erosion just because of the water flow, uh, things like that. So I mean again, maybe replacing or sanding some, some wood is not a big deal, but some of the erosion issues and so forth are the bigger ones that we talked about that we couldn't possibly need funding for. So. Is it a lot of money, or is it something that could be managed um, between the rec and the school department? Yeah, it's probably something that could be managed between the school department, but I think it's more of just you know facilitating a plan as to what we want to happen, whether we're going to plant new bushes and plants there, or if we're going to just grade it off and then you know grass seed it. Um, so again, I think it's just a bigger conversation of what we want it to look like after it's done. I mean, we've done a couple of them in the last about well, four or five years, and. They're not inexpensive, um, so it's um, it doesn't. It only takes a few items to, to run the cost up, you know, to a decent amount. So I just think the parents would like to have this happen. You know, whatever you have to do to make it usable for the kids, <coughs> make it happen. I think we'll try to do the repairs in the short term, and then you may see this as a warrant article okay. uh, coming up. I think that's the type of expense we're speaking yeah. about. Okay. So, any any other subcommittee reports? Um, instruction and technology, Dr. Conti. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to call up Carrie Purchase, Josh Murphy, and does he miss Barton? Mr. Durbin, come on up. This is exciting. Middle school team. Carrie, do you want to introduce Patrick? You want to? Get, I can. You want to do your thing? Well, I can introduce Mrs. Sturdivant, who can speak much more passionately and intelligently about the National History Day program. Um, so, this past fall, Mrs. Sturdivant, um, who is a sixth grade social studies teacher at Marshall Simons Middle School, presented um, a, an idea, a proposal, um, something that I had never heard of before, um, quite honestly, um, and was so enthusiastic about bringing National History Day to Marshall Simons Middle School um, through the support of, um, you know, the uh, Dr. Conti. We were able to add a, an extracurricular activity. She recruited students, um, and they were amazing. Um, I believe that the theme was <coughs> tragedy, <coughs> tragedy, triumph and tragedy. Um, these are projects that students um, identified themselves, did the research, and um, created products in a, in a variety of ways. So I will let Mrs. Sturdivant talk about. So National History Day um, is its own organization, but it is supported by the Smithsonian um, 
the U.S. government and many other organizations as well. And it is open to students in grades 6 through 12 in two different divisions. Marshall Simons competes in the junior division 6 through 8. And every year in June, they inform us of a new theme and students may begin working on the theme. So this past year, it was Triumph and Tragedy. And the goal is students picking a topic that is interesting to them that also connects to the theme. But a primary focus is the use of primary resources and learning different researching skills, as well as putting together an annotated bibliography. There's individuals and groups. The groups can go up to five students and they can showcase their research and their hard work in a variety of different ways. And we had about 30 so students this year um, who did National History Day, which was amazing turnout for our first year. We had six different projects move on to the state competition from the district competition, which was just a local area. And from there, as a total Surprise in our first year, but not a surprise seeing these projects. Mm -hmm. We had two different groups move on to the national competition, which will be held from June 9th to June 13th at College Park, Maryland, at the University of Maryland. Mm -hmm. And those students who are moving on are, represent one individual group, uh, individual performance, and three students work together on a group documentary. So if that is okay, I would like to call them forward. Mm -hmm and they can introduce themselves and talk a little bit about what they did their topics on. Oh, okay, Julia, why don't you go first? Yeah. Hi. I'm Julia Schwartzman and I'm in sixth grade. Oh, I did, I did the um, junior individual performance. Um, mine was on Rosie the Riveter. Um, we've been doing all this since, what, February? October. 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 A long time. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it's really exciting to be going to nationals with all of them. And yeah. So, Julia, we had a chance to chat at school one day, and um, you told me some stuff I never knew about Rosie the Riveter. So, um, what's was there a Marilyn Monroe reference in there? Do I remember yes, that correctly? Yes, Marilyn Monroe was actually at Rosie the Riveter, one of them, before she was Marilyn Monroe, and that's actually how they discovered her. At the time, she was just Norma Jean Baker, and they went to go take pictures of the Rosies, and they thought she was pretty. Um, so, th and the other thing, Julia's um, category was performance, so she actually performed as Rosie the Riveter, is that correct? Yes. And how was that? How many people were around? Um, not that many, just the judges, Ms. Sturdivant, um, my mom, the Latin teacher, <laughs> um, and some of my friends, yeah. There'll be a lot more people. Yeah. At nationals. <laughs> so the top two from each category move on to nationals. So it's um, all 50 states are represented, plus um, many of the island territories, Puerto Rico, Guam, and many overseas schools that are part of the Department of Defense schools. So military-based schools in Germany, Japan. So Julia will be up against around 105 or six other individual performances. All right, you three? That's awesome. Um, hi, I'm Emerson. Um, oh. uh, I'm Noel Martin. I'm in seventh grade at Marcia Simons Middle School. And I'm Matt Shannon. Um, we're all in seventh grade. <laughs> um, we... Um, made a uh, documentary on the Woburn Cancer Cluster. Um, it was in the like 70s and 80s, um, a big company, WR Grace, polluted um, the drinking water, and um, some of, like, I think eight families, um, yeah, eight families um, were affected and were diagnosed with leukemia. 
and the families um, hired a lawyer and Jan Schlickman, and he um, helped them get a lot of money. So, <laughs> what was the coolest thing you guys got to do? And I think we got to interview the lawyer. We got to interview. We got to yeah. We got to interview the attorney and um, two of the moms who lost their children. It was way back in the 70s and 80s, huh? <laughs> <laughs> way back then, Tom. Last century. So these three took first place at the um, state competition for a junior documentary. They will also be going up against 100 plus other documentaries as well. It's just awesome. I, I watched the video. It's usually not that exciting to interview a lawyer, but uh, <laughs> he's he, quite the lawyer. he was quite the lawyer. So uh, the best part for these three and for Julia is between each competition, they're able to go through and revise their work. So Julia pretty much doubled her project yeah. between districts and states. You guys didn't quite double it, we, but you got the whole thing. more we interviews did, we, we did. and everything else. Yeah. There, there are standards that they have to meet. There cannot be more than, both of these groups, they cannot be more than 10 minutes. Um, that's really only the major rule for you guys, yeah. right? Yeah. The other categories have more. Um, other students that I just want to give a shout out to, we did have two groups take third place, so they were runner up to go to the national competition and they were really hoping that they would get to go. Um, there were some little plans that were probably not great, but um, <laughs> they had all kinds of plans that they were going to do to try to get it to go as a group. We had an eighth grade student, Layla Ahmed, who took third place for her paper on apartheid. And we had a group of four seventh grade girls, Julia Griffin, yeah, Nora, uh, Nora Crossman, Natalie Simolka, and Jules Pescatelli who did a group um, exhibit board project on Eliza Hamilton <coughs> because they were very passionate Hamilton fans and they learned so much. We also had another student um, just find out last week that he won a prize for the best junior project on the American Revolution and that was Aidan Khalifa who wrote a paper on the battles of Lexington and Concord. So for our first time out, wow. We did incredibly well as a group. And if you do want to see, their documentary is being revised. Yes. So yes. still a work in progress. Um, Hers our, will be filmed shortly. Our state's um, documentary that we presented um, at states is up on YouTube mm -hmm. under the Wuburn Cancer Cluster. Um, so um, you can find it there. It's on the school website as well. And I'll, mm -hmm. I'll repost it on Facebook tonight too. So. Uh, we look great. forward to seeing the new version. And the exhibit is on display at the um, Marshall Simons Library. Great. Oh, great. Excellent. Wow. That'd be great. Can we, uh, can we get a picture and uh, give Mr. Evan just incredible um, leadership in this. I know you did a great job highlighting the kids, but thank you so much for all You're the effort welcome. that you They did put in the majority of the work. Do you guys come around? Please. Gary and Josh, you guys spread out Oh, Swiss school. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Am I in the seat? Yes. Yes. Oh, They're coming down. <laughs> We're all going to do it right up front. That way, parents, if parents want to do it. We don't want Bob in the picture. Uh, I'm going to be in front. <laughs> you all get Julia, you got to be in front. <laughs> all of you in the front. <laughs> you guys did a wonderful job. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. There's no clicking sounds anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever the click noise. Yeah. <clears throat> Great job. Um, we also want to thank Ms. Sturdivant for bringing this program to our school. It was a wonderful opportunity. Even though I had Really nice. I hope everybody in town becomes aware of that. It's just, we're so proud of you, really. We're so proud of you. We can put Carrie on the spot again. No, we just, uh, we didn't, um, we heard in between sort of the planning for this meeting, you had some Latin scholars mm -hmm. do very well. So come on up and tell us about your Latin scholars, and then um, 
I think, Madam Chair, she's next on the agenda as well. I believe one of our Latin scholars are here. Yes. Come on, Come on down. Oh, no, here we go. I didn't realize that. Latin scholar. So, and I will apologize because I don't have the actual printout um, and we'll be able to recognize um, all of the students who achieved a great honor. You can send um, it to us. We will absolutely send it to you. I believe there's a blog post um, drafted as well and, and publicized. Um, so, Mr. Walsh, who's our Latin teacher, um, each year our students participate in the National Latin Exam, both at the seventh grade level and the eighth grade level. Um, this year, in seventh grade, four, four of our students got perfect scores. Um, on the National Latin Exam, which is really a testament to their hard work and to um, Mr. Walsh's um, support of their, their hard work. It's not an easy um, feat. It was. Do you want to talk a little bit about the exam? Yeah, so it is all, it can go from Latin culture to comprehension. So it's a wide range of studying that we did for every Monday or so. And we, took it for about an hour and everybody didn't finish until like 30 minutes over the time because we all wanted to get really good scores so it was really hard as well. I think your perseverance paid off. It's mean, quite an accomplishment to be a, a national award winner and go into nationals for National History Day. Um, so quite impressive. Thank you. So we will definitely get that information to the committee. I want to throw out there as well that the other two members of Matt's um, History Day team also were awarded for their scores. Yes. Um, so maybe not perfect, not but perfect still, still ranked. But they were <laughs> close to perfect levels. <laughs> yeah, so the other perfect scores were Nathaniel Chow, Julia Griffin, and Alexis Emerson. Mm -hmm. And certainly congratulations to Mr. Walsh as well for his guidance. Latin and language of the future. <laughs> Comments? Just amazing. It's pretty fun. Thank you. Thank you. It's kind of unbelievable. So again, just uh, for context, if, I'm sorry if this was already said, but 22,000 students around the globe actually took this exam. Like, um, so it's not just the national Latin exam, it's really international, but I think the name of the company that uh, sponsored it is the national Latin exam. So. Um, 442 in the country, uh, perfect scores, and we had four at Marshall Simons. Okay, um, Dr. Khan, do you want to move into the next item? I was going to have you guys stay up, so um, I can. So uh, the middle school, again, this is um, uh, Carrie's. Uh, in Josh's first year in leadership of the middle school. Again, I think they're doing an outstanding job. Um, I think a lot of the year has been developing relationships, um, getting to know, again, outstanding teachers like Ms. Sturdivant uh, that um, make up the middle school staff, and then looking, some, looking at some aspects uh, of the middle school. And um, one of the aspects that we've been hearing about for a while is the middle school schedule. And so, um, <coughs> I'm going to let Carrie and Josh sort of talk about the, the process they went through, which I think was extensive, um, guiding principles. Um, and just as everyone sort of knows that um, scheduling, like anything else, is about compromise um, because we're trying to fit a whole lot of programming and a whole lot of services into a, a limited time frame. So we have to make some choices. And a lot of... Um, when you have to make choices and compromises, there's going to be um, opinions on either side of those. And that's why I think it's really important to uh, establish some guiding principles uh, like we try to do when we redistrict. And I just think we're going to um, speak to those guiding principles. And I hope that you'll see those guiding principles reflected <laughs> in the decisions that were made about the schedule. Um, one of the points, uh, Madam Chair, um, or Vice Chair, or Chair of the evening, um, um, I think on the agenda it said something about um, this is not, um, you're not expecting a vote tonight. We're going to approach this like a um, sort of a policy conversation. So this is really meant to be a first first reading. This is really the first time school committee would see the new schedule uh, in, in depth. I know that you're receiving some comments from some parents. There may even be some parents yeah. here who want to comment there are on it. People who will want to speak <coughs> afterwards. So we can speak after. And so this, this, we're not again just for everyone. We're not deciding tonight. We're we're learning tonight. And then um, 
and I think we can um, take the feedback that we get and sort of look at um, what's been going on and move forward from there. So it's challenging. Bob's getting some new technology. Bob is getting some technology for us. So, um, so we'll, why don't we start with yeah, just, a just the conversation and, the and you can talk about the process. Yeah. So I want to um, first um, recognize, as you did, Ms. Monica, that this is a challenging um, conversation. It's something that we um, identified, and it wasn't that you know Josh and I came in and identified this as, as a need. This was something that came out of an early conversation with faculty last June, um, and when they were asked, what's the one thing, if we could only focus on one thing, what would it be? Um, and a, a large percentage of people said the schedule, time on learning, inclusion. Um, so people who had been living the schedule identified that as a need. Um, and started. So tonight we're going to go over the review process, um, the, the process that we engaged in. Um, we'll go over um, kind of what the proposed schedule is, and then we're also going to provide an overview of the program of studies. Um, not a narrative-based program of studies, but um, certainly kind of our so scope and sequence of what we're proposing over what a, what a student's experience would be for you know in their uh, career um, at Marshall Simons <coughs> Middle School. So before we head in, I do want to recognize um, the the number of conversations that we've had and really um, want to um, show my gratitude and my appreciation. So we had a, uh, we engaged a faculty advisory committee in this process. We had about 20 to 30 people who on a monthly basis volunteered their time to be part of this process. And there were some very difficult conversations that we've had to have and that we continue to have. So I just want to, to recognize that. Um, what we're presenting to you tonight is not what, um, you know, kind of what we started. It has evolved over time. And I don't foresee this being, you know, when, when the committee does vote on this, I don't see this being the end of the conversation. I think it becomes the beginning of the conversation that it becomes part of our regular process, that each year we look at the schedule to make sure it's meeting the needs of, of our students. Um, and to my knowledge, I'm not sure that that's been kind of done in, in a very long time. I think that as needs have come up, there have been things that have been added um, over time. But I think that this was um, one of the first times where we took a couple steps back and we really looked at what it is um, that we currently have and what it is that we hope to have. So, you ready to drive? Yep. Okay. So as I said, um, you know, I, I think you've seen this picture before. This was a, a need identified by the faculty, the people who've been um, working at Marshall Simons Middle School far longer than I have. And um, this was the beginning of our timeline. We identified the need. We established a faculty advisory committee in September. Um, and that committee started with um, identifying what, what's good about the schedule, what works with this, the current schedule, and then also the opportunities for growth. Um, and the needs, we, um, we looked at other middle school schedules. We didn't just look at local schedules. I think we had schedules from North Carolina and maybe even the West Coast um, where we looked at what are other middle schools doing. Um, and not to say that what other middle schools are doing are better than what we're doing, but just so that we're not kind of starting at scratch. Like what, what's out there, what's working, what doesn't work. Um, at that point we came um, after looking at over 30 schedules um, the faculty said, okay, let's look at a few <coughs> possibilities for Marshall Simon. So we took the feedback from looking on um, the schedule review of other middle schools, and we went back to the faculty advisory committee um, with three or four different schedule models and um, different meeting patterns and, and things. From there, again, got feedback, um, and kind of where we landed um, was in our first version of what we're going to show you tonight. Um, we shared that out with the broader faculty um, in our um, school council in February, and then we started to test it out because that's the that's the other piece that we need to make sure that not only do we have you know a schedule that on paper works, but that when we start making sure that we have enough places for kids to go to and, and make sure that all works. So our original draft um, of the proposed schedule didn't end up working. There were some barriers and some challenges that we hit, um, some hiccups that then forced some um, additional conversations um, and. Um, again, really appreciate and respect the advocacy of certain groups and um, certain departments because there were definitely, um, you know, some give and take and, and some compromise through this and I appreciate their willingness. Um, we came back in April, which seemed like a really long time ago, <coughs> with a um, proposed, um, a, a revision of the schedule um, in, a, in a way that we thought would work. Um, we continue to feel confident that this will, will go forward as we continue to test models out. Um, and getting ready to kind of really test it out. So I think if you look at the image we have up um, there now, that shows, I think it's grade six. So <laughs> our, the biggest problem we have in the building right now is we don't have a schedule, we have nine schedules. We have three different grade levels, three different teams per grade level, and each team has their own unique schedule. 
Um, the current schedule, I mean, if you just look at it there, you can see the inconsistency really quickly with a quick glance, even from this far away. Um, so the second piece of this current model is that we're on a Monday through Friday kind of fixed schedule. So anytime we hit a Monday holiday, or, which are a few throughout the year, um, those classes aren't happening. So those classes that meet on the Mondays are meeting less throughout the year um, than potentially the other courses. Um, the biggest piece here that you can see is the, in the inconsistent um, instructional times. Um, I'm going to actually stand up and just point. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, <clears throat> if you look at the middle schedule on the second day, you can kind of see that all the, all the blocks that are colored are where students are in math, science, social studies, or ELA. Okay, all the areas that are kind of in white are where they're at some sort of allied art, um, whether it's tech ed, consumer science, PE, health, etc. Um, so if you look at this, the Tuesday on the second schedule, you can see that, that they, have, they go to four specials that day. So their academic blocks are only 25 minutes. So only getting 25 minutes in each academic area. And then the very next day, they're hit with classes that are kind of closer to 70 minutes. So both students and teachers are dealing with that inconsistency throughout the week um, and throw in a snow day here or there and, um, and any lesson that you had planned for you know, the, that, the 75 minutes or whatever is kind of out the window because you're not getting that time back. We also have a, a, a decent number of split blocks. So you can see where one class might meet where it's before either lunch and a few specials and then they come back again. So while that class might meet for 50 minutes throughout the day, they're doing two smaller um, meeting times. Um, so those are all you know, some of the, the major kind of challenges we're dealing with. A second piece to this is the, the, the special classes, um, they all have inconsistent durations as well. So a lot of the special classes might meet for one quarter or one semester or a full year and some of them meet for a half of a quarter. So there's inconsistency in times, uh, the number of times they meet during the week, and the duration in terms of the school year. Um, in the current schedule, some of the program, some programming we have in the building is taking place during core academic time. So that's one thing that we were looking to address um, as a major challenge. Um, we have a fantastic music program. We love what our kids uh, have accomplished throughout the years with our music program. But currently, right now, a lot of those times where they're getting music instruction is happening in place of core academic instruction. They're being pulled out of an academic class to then go attend or, or to go um, work with a music teacher. Special education services are, are challenging uh, with a schedule like this because you can see that none, nothing lines up. So when we have maybe one service provider that we want to work with four or five different kids at the same time, it's tough for them to actually find a spot in the week where they can actually work with those kids. So we have, it makes us, we have a lot of resources in this district. We are, we are very rich with resources. I think this, the school committee and the superintendent have done a great job supporting us and, and getting us what we need. But we, we can't, we're using them very inefficiently. So um, the, the fact that everything is scattered um, really impacts the, the way that we can provide special education. Um, also, there, uh, the activity block takes place on um, Tuesdays and Thursdays at the very end of the day. Um, it is a 40-minute block at the end of the day. Um, right now, there's a wide range of activities that are happening, so our music ensembles and music groups are practicing at that time. Um, and then we have a very wide range of other activity offerings for the, the students, whether it's something more athletic, there are some academic-based ones, some that are more kind of extracurricular activities, um, so there's a lot of inconsistency there as well. And I think one of the, the big factors that you don't really look, you don't really notice when you first look at it, there's no transition times built in. So when one class ends on the schedule, another class is beginning immediately. So we know that students, it takes them more than two seconds to get from one place to another. And if you are coming from the gym area and going to a sixth grade classroom, it's a decent hike to get there. So none of that stuff is built into the schedule, so we are, we're losing instruction there as well. So our, the, the goal of <clears throat> we came up with for a new schedule is we hoped, it, we hoped to create a master schedule for Marshall Simons Middle School that effectively meets the diverse need of all learners. 
allows us to efficiently use available resources and offers our students a well-balanced curricular program including allied arts classes. And as Dr. Conti said, um, we also established some guiding principles as we went through this. Um, consistent instructional times is very important as we talk to our faculty <coughs> advisory committee. They also identified 50 minutes uh, um, an instructional block as kind of being the magic number. Um, they were, um, you know, very clear that they didn't want to go under 50 minutes um, in terms of, you know, 47 minute blocks to allow them time to meet the individual needs of students and to plan rigorous instruction. Um, we were hoping to reduce the number of pullouts. We weren't looking to eliminate the number of pullouts, but reduce them. Um, the disruptions to learning for students and, you know, for the individual student and for the class um, can be very problematic in terms of, um, you know, how do we plan something when you know that, you know, five of your students might be in a, in a band rehearsal or in a lesson or different things. So I think that um, we were looking at ways to minimize that and maintain programming which was another one of our guiding principles. We did not want to come into this and say, okay, we are going to eliminate this program. We wanted, um, Marshall Simons actually offers m more programming um, in, in the Allied Arts Department than most middle schools do, um, and that was a priority for us to, um, to maintain that. And that meant that there needed to be some, some give and take along the way, that it was, it was gonna be difficult to fit that into the, the day as it stood. Um, we were looking at providing more tra uh, consistent transition times for students and being transparent about those times so that there's, there's clarity of, of when that's happening. Um, increasing lunch time for students. Um, right now, students have 20 minutes to eat lunch and that includes transition time. So if their class ends, they get to the, um, the cafeteria, they need to buy lunch, get lunch, and then they're on their way within 20 minutes. So we need to give them time to go from their classroom to the cafeteria. Um, I don't know about anybody else, but 20 minutes is really short um, to time for lunch. Um, and then we wanted to maintain the opportunities for collaboration as much as we could for our, for our faculty. So, our proposed schedule structure. So the, the bell schedule that we kind of settled on is we're going to continue to have a abbreviated homeroom period at the very beginning of the day. Um, our teachers felt like it is an important piece to be able to get, get all the housekeeping items done. Um, we did shorten it a little bit um, in hopes, with hopes that the expectations are that students are there by 735 and we can kind of get, get ready for business as quick as possible. Um, we have six blocks, so it's a six block day, so the students will be attending six classes throughout the day. Um, and each block is going to be 54 minutes long. Uh, the only difference to that would be the fourth block of the day. And the reason why that ends up being 60 a little bit longer is that we are we have to also offer lunch during that time. So to have three 25-minute lunches and classes, that ends up requiring that time to be a little bit longer. Um, so some of our students, if they went to the first lunch, they would have lunch first, then go to class. If they had the third lunch, they'd go to uh, class and then go to lunch. And if they were in the second lunch, they would they would still have a split block. Um, and we've talked about different ways where we can kind of rotate that around um, so it's not the exact same students with a split block um, all the time. And I just want to point out the reason why bell is in quotes <clears throat> is because we don't necessarily want to actually ring a bell during the day. Um, our clock, clocks are synchronized, so we're just um, posting consistent times across the building for movement. Um, the last piece in there is um, time to, as you know, we are a one-to-one. -one. We are lucky enough to be a one-to-one -one school. Um, and there is kind of a bit of a commotion sometimes for students returning devices at the end of the day. Um, you know, some students might be with their team, but other ones might be in kind of a, an allied art, whether it's PE or health. A lot, a lot of our teachers um, that are in those, you know, allied arts areas do um, use the, the iPads for instruction. Um, so we wanted to make sure we had something built in so teachers uh, can, can use the devices and feel comfortable using devices and we have time to kind of get them back in an organized way. <clears throat> so, um, we are also proposing a six-day rotating schedule um, so that we are able to, um, one, account for that you know, day of week piece where um, essentially a Monday through Friday is a five-day rotation. Um, we are looking at six days. It also provides us additional places to maintain our programming in terms of allied arts um, when we look at the, the different um, meeting patterns as we go into the program of studies. 
we are proposing a rotating schedule um, as you know we're not all morning people um, so you know if, if you had the same class every morning um, when you started off your day and it was your least favorite class it would be you know, difficult um, maybe to get motivated to come to school I also think that when you when you talk to teachers um, sometimes you see different kids at different points in the day some kids are ready to go first thing and some kids are ready to go at the end of the, the day so really um, maintaining that so that they would be seen at different points during the day um, is, is an effective piece. This also accounts for where we may have a split block is that lunch block. So if you had second lunch, we might still have that split instructional block. And um, I think that this would make sure that it's not hitting the same class every day as well. So rotating schedule, um, day one would be the first day of school. So this is an example of what it would look like for the first few weeks of September. So day one would be on a Tuesday. Um, day five would be the following Monday. Day six would be Tuesday. And then the next day one would be on Wednesday. And that would continue throughout the year. And if we had other holidays throughout the year, you would just skip that Correct. day and have the number on Right. So we would plan any um, planned days out of school, um, known in advance, would be reflected in our rotation. Um, snow days, we would end up dropping that day and, and kind of adding it to the end. So that would be an unexpected piece. <clears throat> so we, I mean, we mentioned um, most of the highlights here. Um, it's a six block rotating schedule, 54 minutes of instructional blocks, except for that um, 60 minutes during lunch, the lunch block. Three minutes of transition time, increase the lunch from 20 minutes to 25 minutes with transition time as well. So there's, there's actually a, a little bit more time gained there. Um, we added the end of the day homeroom so that students are able to access their iPads all day long. Um, and again, I, I think that this is something that most, um, during the day, most things are happening where there's a, a designated time where kids are going back to homeroom. So we're just kind of um, formalizing that and being transparent about it. And then um, we are hoping to move to trimesters and semesters for grading periods um, and for grading purposes. And then the other um, piece of this is this will allow students in the same grade to go to their allied arts classes, their specials at the same time. Right now, because there are three different team schedules at each of the grade levels, you go to PE with just the people on your team. You go to um, your health class with your home room. So this will provide additional peer um, interaction across the grade level as well, because now you can go to your world language class with kids from all three different teams. Okay. So the program of studies, again, this is not a narrative form um, that is on our list of things to do for next year, um, but just wanted to be transparent and kind of look at what a child's, a student's experience is going to be over the course of three years. So the core academic classes, which are mathematics, English language arts, social studies, and science, will meet every day, um, six out of six days for the full year. So that is um, something, and it'll be um, a consistent 54 minutes. Um, resulting in fewer transitions for students and um, more consistent instructional time. <clears throat> World language, and I think that this is one of the, um, the difficult conversations we've had, and I, again, I really want to recognize the World Language Department for engaging in a, an ongoing dialogue. Um, currently, students go, in our current schedule, in sixth grade, they go to um, World Language, each of the four World Languages, for half a quarter. So it comes out to about eight to 10 classes per language. Um, and it is really meant for an exploratory, just to, to get a taste of the language and the culture to help them make their decision on the one target language to choose going into seventh grade. The challenging piece is, is that we typically ask kids to identify their language right around now. And so not every student has had that exploratory opportunity to, to taste, to try each of the languages. Um, in seventh and eighth grade, right now students have world language currently for four, they meet four out of five days for 40 minutes. And again, when you add in the transition times, um, they probably have about 35 minutes of instruction um, during that time. Um, what we are proposing is that we are proposing that students um, choose their target language um, entering into sixth grade and that that class would meet for two out of six days for the entire year. And then in seventh grade and eighth grade, it would increase to three out of six days. Um, couple, I'm sorry? You said two out of six. In sixth grade. And then? And three out of six in, in seventh and eighth grade. 
<clears throat> so this, um, you know, uh, certainly represents, you know, two significant changes. One, asking students to select um, which language they're going to study for the next three years as they enter sixth grade, and the second being that instead of meeting four times a week, they're going to be going every other day. Um, I think that with the increase in instructional time in the blocks, so going from a 40-minute block to a 54-minute block, um, under this model, we're actually increasing the contact time for students in one target language. So um, we're going from 11,970 minutes, which is the current time where they study one language, primarily in seventh and eighth grade, and then um, and we're increasing that to 12,960 minutes over the course of three years. Um, now I want to recognize that that's you know that there's concerns around the. Um, you know, the consistency in which they're meeting, um, you know, four out of five versus three out of six. Um, and certainly students, as we transition into next year, that might present, you know, kind of a, a, a blip um, that we would need to account for. I do think that over time um, that, would, that would be accounted for. We'd be increasing the time in the target language and we'd be able to maintain the four languages. Um, after hearing information um, and kind of feedback from families at our, our coffee hour um, that we had a couple weeks ago, um, we are exploring um, a way to, to perhaps see if we can, at least for some part of sixth grade, have that be an exploratory experience, maybe the beginning part of sixth grade, so that students can still have that taste of the language and culture before um, choosing. Um, but again, that's scheduling, and that's master schedule, and, and trying to make sure that we have you know, the, the spaces. So we're not sure that we're able to do that, but we haven't um, given up on trying to, to give them that exploratory um, experience in sixth grade. <clears throat> so our allied arts classes, again, Marshall Simons has a wide range of offerings. Um, we are currently, there is um, reading classes in 6th, 7th, and 8th grade, um, what they would refer to as classroom reading. Um, I think that in 6th grade, our classroom reading curriculum is um, very solid in terms of the skills that we're teaching. Um, they really um, embed a lot of strategies, um, the KDL strategies and close reading. Um, and that was something that we heard from our um, educators that they really wanted to maintain that reading class, that additional reading time and reading instruction in sixth grade. In seventh and eighth grade, um, students also, um, most students uh, will have a classroom reading um, where core different academic teachers, so you might have a math teacher teaching reading or you might have a science teacher teaching reading. Um, and that is um, an experience, and it's, the curriculum there is, is certainly it's reading, um, it's not as well developed. Um, so as we were trying to kind of, again, try to fit as much as we could and, and maintain programming, that is something that, um, a, a change that we're putting forward, that it would continue in sixth grade for two out of six days, but that we wouldn't have that in seventh and eighth grade, except for students with an identified uh, deficit in reading. Students who needed additional support in reading would continue to get support in reading. Physical education um, is, we're proposing that in sixth grade it would meet two out of six days for the full year, and then in seventh and eighth grade, three out of six days for the full year. Music, um, we are right now, in, um, our current program um, in music is that sixth grade has music one day a week for the entire year. Seventh grade, Mr. Murphy, you're gonna help me out with this one again. It's Seventh grade. Two, two times a week for a half, half a year. year. Um, and then there's currently no <clears throat> music for students in eighth grade unless they're in performance groups. Um, and that was something that wasn't documented anywhere and people have come and said, you, you took me, I'm like, no, I didn't take music away, it hasn't been. Um, so we felt it was really important that students, especially in middle school where they, they're still developing their passions, they might not know what they don't like or what they do like unless they're, they're kind of um, you know, given the opportunity to experience that we wanted every student to have a music experience over the course of three years at the middle school. Um, we also um, very much wanted to make the performance groups a part of the schedule. Right now the performance groups um, either meet during activity block um, and feedback that we've heard from students and from families is that their child going into sixth grade will decide not to, to continue with their instrument because that means that they don't get to participate in activity blocks. So we were forcing a choice there. Um, 
or the um, performance groups are also um, meeting during core academic classes potentially, so that they're being pulled from um, core instruction um, to do that. So we were um, trying to come up with a, a system that would allow more students to, to participate in music and that there would not necessarily be kind of a, a choice. Um, there's always choices. We did, we did have to build in some choice, but it is a music choice. So all students um, will, or most students will take music, um, and they can choose band or chorus or orchestra, or general music. So it's a, um, an elective under the umbrella of music department, and that will meet two out of six <clears> days for a full year. So um, we're, we are increasing um, music experience for all of our students. I also want to recognize that in order to do this, and um, as we've gone through this process, we were, we were trying to utilize our existing staff. Um, so in order to do this, and um, you know, to, to also Kind of go back to our guiding principles, which was to reduce the pullouts, is that we are looking at um, eliminating music lessons um, in seventh and eighth grade. Um, we, through some discussion, our original proposal um, did have us eliminating lessons across the board, um, but through ongoing conversations with Mr. Middleton Cox, um, feedback from families, um, we are hoping that we're able to maintain lessons in sixth grade um, so that there's kind of that bridge between the foundational music skills and then the performance groups. <clears throat> art will meet um, two out of six days for a full year in sixth grade. Um, this was something that our art teachers advocated for um, and something, again, that our original schedule that we went forward did not have them meeting every day for a full year, um, but we were able to, um, to, to go back to the drawing board and look at that. And then um, in seventh and eighth grade, they would meet two out of six days for half of the year. Health would meet for two out of six days for a semester across all three grade levels. Um, and then... I'm going to skip over computer science and tech ed, and then the consumer science, so family consumer sciences. Um, right now, students have that for either cooking or sewing for half a quarter um, in all three grades. And what we're proposing is in order to, to maintain that reading instruction in sixth grade is that we would focus on um, family consumer sciences in seventh and eighth grade. Um, it, this does not represent a loss of contact time. So it's just kind of um, compacting that time across two grade levels as opposed to three grade levels. Um, and then the computer science tech ed. So right now students have two um, experiences. They either go to computer class or they go to computer class and a tech ed class. Um, and with the district um, really focusing on computer science for all and um, de in developmental levels of, of students, that we're really um, excited to kind of combine those two separate um, departments or, or classes and really focus on providing um, computer science. Um, at all grade levels with different focuses, so kind of the, the foundational computer science discoveries in sixth grade um, and continuing that through seventh and eighth grade and then also bringing elements of engineering um, and information sciences into that. So that, what the schedule accomplishes, um, kind of going back to what our goal was, um, is that it's a unified building schedule. So we would be on one building schedule. Um, we would all be kind of moving at the same time. Our classes would be consistent lengths. Um, we have longer student lunches and consistent instructional time. Includes time for transitions. Again, they're already transitioning. We're just you know, kind of saying this is the time that they're actually moving. Um, it maintains instructional time in the core academics. It maintains programming. There were adjustments in programming, but nothing was eliminated. It's reducing the number of pullouts um, in terms of the rehearsals happening, and it's also reducing the number of lessons that are happening during core instruction. It maintains collaborative time for core academic teachers, and then the trimesters and, um, or semesters for grading periods. <clears throat> so just to um, look at a couple sample schedules. Some people find the different colors helpful, some people don't, um, but this would be um, a sample of a sixth grade schedule um, where you can see where um, in this sample A math is that kind of fuchsia color and you can see how that rotates through the six days. Um, and that's the same for all four core academics, so math, ELA, social studies, and science. Um, for this particular um, schedule, their allied arts times would be during that, the B block, which would then rotate, so that's the, the lighter pink colors. Um, so reading would be on day one and four, so that's the two out of six. PE would be on day two and day five. And then, I lost the pink, um, it's dark pink. Music, music would be on days color. three and six. 
Um, and that music could get, again could be orchestra, band, or chorus. Um, the other allied arts block would be um, art, so that would be days one and four for the full year. And then days two and five, it's health or computer science. So that's where that semester would switch. So if you started in health class, you'd have computer science the second half of the year. If you started in computer science, you'd have health class the second um, half of the year. And then world language would be the two out of the six in the sixth grade schedule. And then seventh, eighth, very similar. Um, the difference being the world language and the PE. So world language would meet three out of six days in this model, and then PE would complement that on the opposite days. And then the um, semester courses um, would be in that um, second allied arts block, and then the music classes um, would be meet for the full year. So. Um, also, in, in um, wanting to be transparent, I think it was about a year ago um, that I started learning uh, more about Marshall Simons Middle School and their program of studies, and I've had many conversations over the course of the year around mathematics at the middle school. Um, and currently, um, we have um, three levels of mathematics. Um, we have the D block, which is the accelerated. Each team has one D block class. Um, B and C block, which is the grade level, and then we have A block, which is the what they would term the inclusion block. Um, I think that um, they're all meeting the standards. I think that um, the three levels really is, is about um, going much you know um, slower in terms of their pacing in that A block math, um, not providing as, as many <coughs> opportunities for application, whereas D block's going at a faster pace. Um, what we are proposing going forward. And so I, th I think that one transparency that if you didn't have a child who went through Marshall Simons Middle School before, you might not know about D block math and you might not know about B and C block math. So one, we wanted to just kind of, you know, kind of put it out there and say, um, this is what we're currently doing. Um, and two, I think that um, one of the challenges to this is that in the past, because there was only three sections of D block math, that um, one class sizes went up and that um, teachers were only asked to recommend. 26 or 27 um, of, of kind of their highest performing math students for that class. Um, what we're proposing for next year is that we're going to have two levels of mathematics. Um, one is going to be the accelerated, um, which kind of translates to the D block. Um, and we are going to have as many sections as needed. Our teachers right now are going through a recommendation process. They've established um, criteria that looks at a variety of data po uh, points, including um, kind of the, the characteristics of a learner, learner or habits of a, a learner. Um, and then we'll have the grade level um, class as well, and that special education services will be provided based on a student's IEP. Right now, um, some of our A block classes have a high percentage of students on IEPs um, and 504s, and we're looking to make sure that students are getting what they need in that inclusive setting, um, so much more heterogeneously grouped across those two levels. In the future, um, kind of an ongoing conversation is really um, looking at identifying um, students who are um, are able to learn at, at faster paces and are really ready for, for more of a challenge and looking at compacting our seventh and eighth grade frameworks into one year and then bringing a true um, algebra one course so um, into the eighth grade so um, and we've had conversations with um, the high school around that as well so again just um, where that that typically happens with D block goes into um, you know is, is kind of an algebra one um, but there are, are you know I, I think you know in other places it's you know there are some of the standards that are missing so we just want to be moved towards in that direction so that oh 21st century learning <clears throat> so that brings us to this um, is an exciting an exciting one so I think one thing you, you um, we, we were talking about doing is um, what, with taking the music um, groups and kind of turning that into a class, um, we were really kind of packing our schedule full of, um, you know, both core academic classes and allied offerings for kids. Um, and we wanted to make sure that we still found time throughout the school year to kind of do some of those um, outside of the classroom learning opportunities for students. Um, so. We had, some, we had a group of teachers that had gone to Nipmunk Regional um, School recently, I believe it was uh, in the January, February timeline, um, and they uh, basically had kind of done something similar, and you know, essentially their high school, they shut the, the school down for the day, and a lot of kids are working on either service projects or they're bringing in outside um, people from the community. It's almost like a professional development day for kids, if you want to think about it like that. 
Um, we know the high school, Burlington High School just did something similar with their Health and Wellness Day, um, where they were, um, had all sorts of different offerings for students. So what we're currently kind of terming the 21st Century Learning Conference, that's not an official term, but that's what we're, we're using for now. Um, we would look to kind of do it three times throughout the year, once each kind of trimester, um, where we would kind of go with a different schedule for the day where we could offer all sorts of different activities for students that um, focused on their passion, different creativity, uh, and the different skills that they have. It would give us a chance to you know, capitalize on all the different resources we have in this community. We do have, a, you know, how, how many how many businesses are actually on the other side of 95 or down near um, the Middlesex Turnpike that we could be tapping into and bringing folks in here to kind of work with our students, which isn't really easy to do on a regular basis to say, can you come here for 40 minutes every Tuesday and Wednesday for the next month and a half? Um, but if we can kind of give them a day ahead of time, we can set up some pretty interesting opportunities um, for students. The other thing that would be nice about this is that it can be kind of thematic, so each one of the three could have, you know, one could be more of kind of a social emotional health and wellness day, another one could be more kind of career oriented. Um, so again, this, we're in the early stages of having these conversations, but there's a lot of opportunity here. Um, and I think we had the Burlington High School uh, student leaders come down and work with our seventh graders recently. Um, as peer educators, and it would be another kind of great opportunity to get kids down from the high school, um, you know, with both of our schedules kind of rotating, starting at different times, it's not as easy to kind of collaborate with them. Um, so infusing these days into our year um, will really help, um, you know, foster those relationships. Mm -hmm. So it's something we're very excited about. <clears throat> that is it. Okay. <laughs> so why don't we start with comments from the committee and then we'll open up to anyone else who wants to speak. Um, can you just take a second and explain the trimester? Mm -hmm. Do we get report cards for? Is it going to tie into that? So, so, yeah, so I think that we're early on we were looking at the um, some of our allied arts classes meeting on a trimester basis, which started the, the trimester conversation. Um, the faculty were really uh, kind of excited about the, the three um, marking periods. Right now we have four and we do, um, we actually have eight because we do progress reports and the progress reports aren't an actual um, representation of the grade. It's you get a, your, your child's in this range. Um, so what we are, so that's where the conversation started. It had to do with the meeting patterns of classes. Um, what we're proposing is that if we go to the trimester piece, that we're also looking to leverage our um, online gradebook through Aspen um, and get more consistent use so that there's more up-to-date information across a, 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 across the, the grading period. Um, so which right now, it's, it, there's not a lot of consistency across the building. Some people use it every day. Some people only use it to enter grades. So we're hoping to, um, to become more consistent. Um, so that you can go on to Aspen and see where, where your child's current progress is and, and kind of rely on that. Um, so that's where that came from. Um, so it's the trimester or semester. So the classes that meet from on a semester basis, um, if you think of it, because if we're looking at trimesters, it would be a 60 day and, you know, in terms of a trimester, and then it would be 30 days. So what we would have is like, you know, kind of a long grading period and then a really short grading period. So for classes that are meeting on a half year basis, we're proposing that there be two progress reports and then one final grade. So that, or no, three progress reports, no, two, two progress reports. So that they would get a progress report in the middle of the first trimester, they would get a progress report at the end of the first trimester, and then they would get a, a final grade for the Allied Arts class at the end of the um, semester. The end of? The, so the half year mark. So it would be the second progress, it would be the progress report for the second trimester. So then when we get the second report card, which mm -hmm. would be the end of the it would be around second, March, yep. that would have the final grade for the half year? Yeah. It would be listed there. Yep. So we, you would get it before that. So you'd get it on the progress report, but then it would be on that report card as well. Okay. All right. And, um, then the other question was uh, being. Mm -hmm. Is that saying? We, 
Yeah. So um, when we when we went through this process, um, again, we were trying to reduce the number of, of pullouts, not eliminate, and um, we felt like the structure, we, we had enough on our plate um, in terms of looking at the, the structure of the schedule. So there are no proposed changes to BEAM, except that I believe that they're going to be following the six-day rotation so that it's not going to be pulled out Monday through Friday. Um, so um, right now, because there's five days and there's three grade levels, um, I believe Mrs. Rogers sees all of the seventh grade in one day, so things can get pretty tight in there. So I think that the, the plan is is to kind of split sixth grade, seventh grade. They each get each get two days in in terms of the, the whole grade being split over the course of two days. Oh, there's a lot. <laughs> there, is. there might be some more questions sure. as we go through. But again, you know, this this I don't know how any substitute would walk in and follow those schedules the first time I saw it. So, I mean, this I'm very pleased to see that there's a change and appreciate all the time and energy in the conversations mm -hmm. because each department needs to advocate for themselves. And the last thing you want to do as a teacher or a professional is mm -hmm. lose any of that time in front of the children. Mm -hmm. So Absolutely. I can understand how difficult those conversations are. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I sense this might be a fluid, a, a fluid round, nothing's you know, perfect the first time through. So I can see maybe changes moving through as, mm -hmm. as it gets tweaked and put out. So. Absolutely. I, I think that has to be part of our regular process is what's working, what's not working, and what adjustments we can make. Um, and so I, I think that this is the initial um, step and see us kind of looking at it, like living under it for a while, and then coming back together, getting feedback from, from faculty, students, families, you know, October, November-ish, and then, you know, continuing to look and, and make sure that it meets the needs. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just a couple of quick questions mm -hmm. and, and a general comment, I guess. Um, with the going two out of six, three out mm -hmm. of six for various um, things, is that going to create any staffing issues in terms of um, either teachers taking on more than they used to have or teachers don't have as many classes as they once had? And then what will they be doing in their spare time? So this was a uh, staffing neutral um, um, Kind of play so we were able to again we haven't gone through and, and kind of um, mapped it out completely but based on our early models that we're able to do that in a consistent staffing model so that we're not um, adding staff and we're not reducing staff i think that um, when we talked about one of our early um, kind of struggles was we were trying to maintain world language at four out of six days and that created um, some some challenges along the way um, and again, we, we know that they very much want to have that consistency and be at those four classes um, and knew that we weren't going to be able to do that with our current staffing and um, to be able to fit the rest of this in. So that was where we, we had to make a tough decision. But we should stay um, pretty neutral. I mean, there may be some fluctuation um, in some of our class sizes. Um, right now we have some classes that split a homeroom. Um, so you might go to tech ed and you might see 10 kids at a time in tech ed um, because they're, you know, the two tech ed teachers are splitting a home room. Um, and, you know, in our art class in eighth grade, um, three teachers are splitting two home rooms. So um, our hope is, is that there's consistent class sizes. Um, there's always some fluctuation, but that, that we'll be able to do that across the board. Okay. Um, one idea, <coughs> the exploratory um, world language in the sixth grade, mm -hmm. Um, I wonder if there's any way you can slide some of that introductory material down towards the end of the fifth grade. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kind of, you know, not necessarily have the teachers there to teach in the language, but you could cover some of the cultural stuff mm -hmm. as part of the fifth grade into this end of the year curriculum, just to give them a little taste. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think that we're we're definitely have thought about that, and um, you know, certainly. Um, I just met with each of the fifth grades at all four elementary schools and showed them a video that the teachers put together. Um, and like, and again, I really appreciate it. So it wasn't, you know, I, I think that the timing here is, is not ideal in terms of we're in the middle of the end of the year, but but certainly for the future going forward, that's definitely an opportunity. My general comment, I guess, is and like everybody else, I appreciate the, uh, what you had to do, what you're attempting to do. Um, and that obviously is a lot of work and, and there's a lot of moving parts. Um, one thing that I think we've done a, a good job over the years um, in Burlington recently um, is keeping things like art and music and things of those things out in the, in, in the front burner mm -hmm. where a lot of 
districts had to cut back on that for um, financial reasons and time and learning reasons mm -hmm. and a whole bunch of other reasons. Uh, so it's a balancing test, but I think we've done a relatively good job of, of trying to keep those things um, active and they're very popular in Burlington. And mm -hmm. They move up to high school and we have very successful music programs and art programs because of it. Uh, and I've always been a, I'm, I'm not a STEM guy as much as I'm a liberal arts guy. Mm -hmm. And um, so I like to have that component out there. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> Same with the world languages. Um, you know, the world becomes smaller every day nowadays, and I think it's important that people get exposed to that, and if you can get, uh, get enough of it so you're able to master a second or a third language, I think that's a good thing too. So, mm -hmm. I appreciate that you are keeping that as part of the of the mix, uh, and I understand that it's not as much of the mix in some cases as mm -hmm. it used to be, and I'm sure some. Um, Staff members, parents, students mm -hmm. probably won't be happy about that. Um, the one thing that I try to keep in mind is you never make everybody happy, so you try to do the best you can with what you have. And I, I think you do. I think you're really making an effort to do that here, and I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, I would be nervous if you scaled back any further on some of those things mm -hmm. because I, I, I think they're an important part of the picture. Um, and. Uh, so I appreciate what you've done, and um, you know, ideally, you could try to squeeze some more into it, but without increasing the size of the day or whatever. Obviously, mm -hmm. there's only so much you can do. But yeah, no, I, I just do. urge you to kind of keep that. Um, don't be as quick as I think some other districts have been over the years in, in, in cutting those out because focus on the uh, reading, writing, and arithmetic, and mm -hmm. you know, that other stuff tends to slide. No, I, I, I appreciate that. I think it's really important, um, especially at middle school, that they have that students have a wide range of experiences. And um, I think that when you talk about programs feeding into the high school, um, when we look at our music program, which is phenomenal, by the way, I think that the quality of our music program is, is amazing. And when I look at a middle school our size, um, it, there needs. I feel like there should be more kids that are, are participating, and I think that some of the um, choices that they've had in the schedule has actually um, forced some some students to say, "Okay, I'm not going to, to you know, to, to kind of continue this." Um, and there's always attrition. You know, there's always kind of you know, like you know, between fifth and sixth grade, some kids make that decision, and then also between eighth and ninth grade. Um, but I am confident that this will start to increase some of our numbers there. And where we did lose some um, contact time overall, and um, in art um, education, um, it was it was not as you know we still have it and it's still an experience every year. So I think that that's really the struggle is to to how to fit it all into a finite number of, of minutes. Well, I appreciate the effort and keep up the good work. And okay. as Kristen said, I'm sure this is a, a moving a moving target. So mm -hmm. um, I'm sure you'll. Keep your eye on it and, and adjust as necessary. Yeah, and we'll, we're open to feedback as well, as, and we continue to be. I, I think that um, you know, in addition to having a coffee hour, um, both in the morning and the after, or in the evening, where we presented this, we also included it in a newsletter. Um, I'm not sure that including it in the newsletter did it justice in terms of not having a narrative and an explanation that goes along with it. Um, so we welcome um, feedback. I've had a number of conversations on the phone, email communication, so we um, would love to hear from folks. Um, met with students. Um, their, their voice was important. We actually presented to student council last Thursday as well. So um, just encourage people to continue to reach out. Thank you. Thank you. Before I ask the audience, mm -hmm. I just have a, a couple of things I want to say. Um, first, I, I applaud your efforts in taking what was kind of a crazy schedule and making one that, that seems to make a lot of sense. Um, I know it's a difficult job to address all the needs and to, to take into consideration everything that everybody wants. Um, quick question, is there a change, if we were to adopt this schedule or something similar mm -hmm. to it, is there a change in the number of report cards each year? So what we would be proposing would be going to three report cards and three progress reports for a total of six, as opposed to what we now have, which is eight. Okay. Um, next question, just um, because it occurred to me. Mm -hmm. um, was there any consideration given to 
at some point in the three years making music and art a choice, like choose one over the other. I mean, I know, you know, some people really <coughs> stink at art like me and, you know, would, would, would rather go to a music class mm -hmm. than that class. I just wondered if there was any consideration given to that. I, I think that there, there was. I think that what becomes challenging and, and is, you know, we're trying to also maintain enrollment in both. So I think that if you, if you present it, oh, you, you know, this year, so maybe everybody in sixth grade gets music and, and art, and then, you know, the same in seventh grade and eighth grade, you get to choose, um, which we can, we can do that. Um, and one is that it's going to impact your art numbers or it's going to impact your music yes. numbers because there's going to be that, that forced choice. And then we, we start getting into challenges with staffing. Um, where we have kind of, you know, by having them choose electives within a department, um, mm -hmm. we know that we're going to have, you know, 12 sections of music or, you know, 13 sections of music, and we can plan for that, even though some of the music offerings might be different. Um, and the same with art. We know that if everybody's taking art, we need 12, 12 sections. Yeah. Um, so that, that becomes the challenge. Um, we have um, spoken with, um, with both uh, Mr. Middleton Cox and uh, George Rackfitch, the art um, director of, of fine arts and um, talked about um, potentially, again, this is step one, is, is getting a structure, but potentially down the, the road looking at developing um, electives within that, um, each of their departments. So that, in, um, so in art, we have three incredibly talented art teachers that all have different passions and, and skills. So maybe we look at um, providing eighth graders an elective in digital photography, um, digital art. Um, painting and drawing, sculptures, um, and that way again we can um, we might not be able to get every student their first choice, but we we could provide choice within the art department, and then we're not kind of pitting one department against another, um, which is which is the challenge. I think you know the same in music. We could look at um, you know developing a drama class, a performing arts class, so so more less on the music end of things, more on the performance end of things, um, to to give students those choices. Yeah, uh, the reason it came into my mind is because, you know, you were talking about how some kids might have their least favorite class mm -hmm. first, you know, thing in the morning on the old schedule and not on the new one, and, and it made me think about, well, there are some classes that some kids probably mm -hmm. don't really like anyway, and when it comes to electives, uh, you know, a little flexibility would be nice, mm -hmm. but, that, you know, leave that up to yeah. you. Um, then there are two areas that um, I want to mention because mm -hmm. I have been contacted about them. Mm -hmm. One is um, the foreign language area mm -hmm. where um, I know there are teachers and parents who feel that foreign language at especially 7th, 8th grade level should be considered a core subject and mm -hmm. should have as much time devoted to it as the others. Just like in high school when you take you know, pick a language, mm -hmm. you don't take it fewer times in a week than you do your other core mm -hmm. subjects. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention. And then uh, the final one, and in some ways to me personally the most um, important, is I think you did a wonderful job. Don't don't get me wrong mm -hmm. in any in any way. I think your your schedule um, it covers all the bases for most of the students. Mm -hmm. But I think you probably have at least fifteen percent of your kids that are special education mm -hmm. kids. And I didn't see this schedule built around their needs. I saw it built. Mm -hmm with maybe, well, we can handle it this way or that way or this way. But I didn't see in the premise that we would build a schedule that would, um, that would put the needs of our 15, say, percent mm -hmm. of our kids <coughs> in their plans um, as a primary focus so that we manage to get them the time that we need. And, that's something, before we go to a final step on this, I'd, I'd ask you to look at again mm -hmm. to see if there's a way that you can handle that. So I, I think that um, in both cases, the world language case and the, the special education piece, um, those one, I want to recognize that um, that 
right now, um, in, in terms of world language, it's not meeting as a core academic subject. It's not mm -hmm. meeting in the same amount of time, um, whether it's daily or in, in terms of, of minutes and, and contact time. So I do recognize that. Um, and as I said, we did try to keep it at four. It created um, staffing issues and it also um, created <coughs> other challenges. I think that um, I'm not opposed to having world language be a core academic and meet every day and the same amount of time as math, ELA, social studies, and science. And that means that there would be less time for, for some of those exploratories and there would, there would have to be a decrease there in order to get that, that same amount of time um, and to meet all of our other guiding principles. Um, in terms of the special education piece, special education students are always in the forefront of our, our thinking, um, as are all students. I think that um, we focused on a, a structure of a schedule um, that would provide us flexibility in scheduling um, and, and giving kids what they need. Um, does it include a, and, and at one point we were looking at a flex block, mm -hmm. um, and in order to, to get that in there, um, it started to impact our, you know, kind of our, our other guiding principles in terms of, um, you know, the length of, of blocks and the periods. And, and honestly, <coughs> started, we, we started saying, well, what are we going to also do, you know, for, for other students? So there, there were some, some challenges there. So I'd just like to, to um, say in terms of having that, that flex block, even mm -hmm. if we were to, to, you know, take four minutes off of each of those blocks, that's only going to give us 20 minutes. Um, and I would argue that 20 minutes is probably not enough to meet, meet some of our students' needs in, in terms of their service delivery. Um, why it's not represented here is that we have individual students, individual plans, so it's hard to, to say holistically this is what you know, special education services would look like. Um, I also want to recognize that right now special education services are happening in lieu of something else. Um, so, so a lot of our students in 7th and 8th grade, for example, um, our, our scheduled students with individual education plans are scheduled into developmental reading, and that's where students um, potentially get their services pulled from. Um, so now they're missing parts of that day, parts of that class, um, and, and trying to keep up and, and doing that. So I, I do think that there are other students, our teachers work with students and families to identify what their preferred classes are. Um, and um, you know, our hope is, is that this schedule provides enough um, flexibility that if we have students who are really passionate about music, that they'll continue to, to, to play music, um, that they're not going to be asked to not play what they're passionate about. We should have enough flexibility to do that in this current schedule. Um, so I would you know, welcome additional conversations around that, um, and I'd like to sit down and, and kind of look at kind of our current service delivery um, in terms of how we're, we're providing those services to students, um, and then also how it might look um, depending on that same service delivery um, going forward, because I think that um, we can we can talk, but until we kind of sit down and see it and operationalize it, it doesn't make um, a lot of sense. And again, it's it's not going to look the same for all students, nor should it look the same for all students. Students should get what they need in school. I wonder if the developmental reading, which not all students take that, a lot of students take that during say foreign language time. That would that be correct? the that would be the that time. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So I wonder if. Um, in a, a situation like that, if, if we could have maybe a different name for the block and have it maybe um, a, a block when pullouts might occur. Um, but then again, there might be a student, you know, they're the same students who probably need the developmental reading. Um, well, but I, I, are there any parents who want to add to this? I, I mm -hmm. see the, the CPAC parents in the, in the back, and I'd be happy to have you give your input if you'd like to come up. Chris, Madam Chair, may I um, do anything you want to <laughs> ask some questions again? If parents want to come up, that's fine. I just, um, Josh, you put the guiding principles again. I think it's really important that you guys um, look at the guiding principles because we're going to have to make compromises. Right. And I think people are talking about um, the programming like an existing schedule sort of isn't here. So I think we have to look at this um, and make sure that we're looking at it in comparison to not what's ideal, but sort of what exists um, presently. And I think the, the guiding principles are going to be something that um, are going to shape the decisions. So we have a, a six hour, 20 minute day, um, a 25 minute lunch. Mm -hmm. um, again, Josh, roughly about what, 18 minutes in passing time? Yeah, barely, yeah. Homeroom, passing time, another 18 minutes. 20, so we're, 25, we're, 27, uh, so we're, we're, we're 23. 
Oh, in the in the proposed schedule, yeah. Yeah. Right. So, so let's say 15 minutes. So we're we're down to like a five hours in 30 minutes, 30 minutes, basically. Um, we have um, four cores identified that are meeting every day. So math, ELA, science, social studies. If you want to add language, that's a that's a fifth. We have, and I just wrote Sounds these like off. Sounds like a junior high, doesn't it? If, well, that's right. So if you want to put this off the sort of, these are off the top of my head. I might admit music, art, health, um, CS Tech, mm -hmm. split, PE, mm -hmm. reading, slash, support, and then family consumer science. Mm -hmm. So we have a, a pretty robust um, allied arts, I think was the term that you used, mm -hmm. program. Um, Again, at some point, this is just a time and space problem. So, if you want um, more flexibility, you're going to have to have less programming. Um, you go to a seven day rotation, but then classes are going to meet less frequently. The high school is on a seven day rotation. Mm -hmm. There's no way you could possibly do this in a five day rotation. There's just no way because you would have what five by five, you would have what 25 by six, 30, 30 blocks of sessions. Um, you could cut back and have your cores meet five out of six. That might give you some flexibility, but then um, you're not meeting every day. But Mr. Murphy, that might, again, satisfy. So I, I think we have to continually go back to the guiding principles, but you're trying to fit 10 pounds of junk in a five-pound bag here. So um, I think the general term is some of the supports that you're providing for students uh, that Mrs. Monaco was mm -hmm. concerned about. Uh, I would say some of that's happening in a push-in type model. So you have. Mm -hmm. So we have a we yeah, are co-teaching um, in ELA and mathematics. We would support students on social studies and science depending on their service delivery. Um, so that is going to continue. I think that. Um, Honestly, a predictable 54 minutes of time um, actually provides those educators um, in the in an inclusion setting to support um, a, a wide range of learners um, in terms of um, giving kind of the direct instruction, some guided practice, some independent practice, and also um, time to, to meet with small groups um, in the in the group. And, and a comment today from a, a parent said, um, "Pushing is great, but my child needs." pull out mm -hmm. some of the time. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I think that um, I think that's important and, and we need to see when that pull out would happen. Um, mm -hmm. I just want to make sure there's still a team-based um, organization Absolutely. because mm -hmm. again, I, I don't want to shift into a mini high nope. school here either. So kids are still going to be organized on nine uh, on nine teams. <coughs> so there'll still be three, four people, four, four person, five person, including the special educator team on each at each grade level. Mm -hmm. Um, they will continue to share the same group of students in the core academics. The difference being that when they go to their allied arts, that they might be with students on different teams. Um, I think that based on the phone calls that I had last summer around placement, and you know, my friend, you know, my best, my child's best friend isn't on this team, that it, it actually provides us some flexibility. Um, and I would argue that developmentally, um, when we have homerooms of, of kids kind of traveling together all day, and some groups do travel, spend the majority of their day together that um, they kind of fight like brothers and sisters and, and kind of, you know, familiarity. So I, I do think that... Um, Not our middle schoolers. No. <laughs> so um, um. so I, I think that, I mean, I think that your, your point and the point that was made by a parent earlier is, is very valid, that some, you know, inclusion is great and some students do require um, specialized instruction outside of that setting. And I think that, um, again, the team makes that decision and then we are, are responsible for fulfilling that. Um, our hope is, is right now they have an academic support um, that is, is kind of there. We're, we're looking at learning centers and having really um, targeted um, direct specialized instruction for students who need it based on what their, their goals are. So another important part of the middle school is uh, adult collaboration. So mm -hmm. is there common planning time from the, we've talked a lot about the student experience, mm -hmm. but there is some common planning time for teams? There will mm -hmm. absolutely be um, common planning time for teams. Um, Beam exists as a pullout? Mm -hmm. And um, so that, again, a pull-up still exists. The music lesson, I've been getting a lot of um, some emails on. Mm -hmm. um, we said potentially um, um, you have three music teachers, but adding in some additional teacher time to possibly do some lessons in six as a transition. Mm -hmm. um, we also even talked possibly about flexing um, some teacher time because we have um, in our current 
bus proposal, we have a late bus mm -hmm. three days a week, is that correct? correct? So there could be a block of time from uh, two to three, possibly where maybe something like an instrumental lesson. I hate to build a schedule around an instrumental lesson because it's honestly not something that we can offer um, everybody. And um, we don't have individual art lessons. And again, I think it's a great thing to do, mm -hmm. mind you, but it's tough to, we have a tight schedule um, already. Um, but I, I sort of like the need. Um, by separating out um, band as a class, mm -hmm. um, your numbers may go up. Mm -hmm. um, and that means you're going to have students of a wider level of ability mm -hmm. um, in those groups. So um, mm -hmm. I, again, I think if you have more select performing groups, those select performing groups um, could potentially meet after school. After school. Mm -hmm. Um, so jazz band, uh, what's what's the band now? The um, symphonic, symphonic. Band. symphonic, and then isn't there a house, uh, Mr. Um, house band? Mr. House Mullen band. has a house band or something like that. So that could. Um, Dr. Khan, you just said the more kids we get into a band program, too, we would be able to offer maybe more than one section of band for a grade level. So within one grade level, you could have kind of two different band groups. So with. More kids are going to be taking music. Mm -hmm. um, the learning spaces now, I'm sort of thinking about classroom spaces. Mm -hmm. um, we have essentially one music room, and then Mr. Middleton mm -hmm. said we need to equip potentially another music room. So we have one general music room, um, or one room that general music is taught in. We have one room that's um, banned in lessons, um, quite large room that, that lessons are taking place in the performance group, and then we have the stage area. So we potentially have three spaces for the music program. But we would have two general music classes meeting concurrently? In some in places. In some places, yep. so we probably need to talk about, yep. um, there may be some supplies and materials that we need to um, equip a, um, um, a, a second space. So um, I just want to stress again, there's no ideal schedule. There, this, there, this there's not. They're going to build it. <laughs> so, um, and again, it's going to be trying to create um, the sort of most robust programming in the amount of time and staff and space that we have. And we have, um, I think, a um, um, very talented staff. I think we have a very robust program. Um, and so we're trying to um, fit it in. And this is going to honestly come down to some minutes that we're going to have to count. I know that sounds si silly, but I think we obviously have to do a time and learning check. We'll do the time and learning check. Um, but I just want to make sure the committee goes back to guiding principles. Mrs. Monaco, I think what the way you're speaking, it sounds like you would like to have them consider adding a guiding principle. Yes. Is that mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Yes. I don't think we can answer you specifically what it would look like, but I think if we could construct um, or maybe talk about adding a guiding principle for um, <coughs> students of pullouts. And the other suggestion I'd like to make in maybe the next week or so is to um, build a schedule two ways. Josh, and I'm looking at you because you might do it, is um, build it from the student's perspective. So if you could give me um, what a day or a week would look like or a six-day rotation or even a 10-day block of time for a grade six student, a grade seven student, a grade eight student. Um, you can give me a core teacher. Um, an allied arts teacher. I don't even care what the subject is. Um, maybe it's some of the different grades. Um, and then you can customize some students because I think some parents are going to want to look at what does this mean for my, right. my kid. Right. And if they could say, okay, I have a kid who's decent at math or decent at band, and um, we can maybe have some samples out there as to what the what the day is actually going to look like. I have a child who needs pull-out services. Um, where is that going to happen? What does that look like? Yeah. Because at some point it's going to be, what do you take out? And again, we all, we're all great at adding, but at some point um, uh, we don't want the kids in school till 4 o'clock, or maybe some people do, but I'm just saying I, I think we... Um, we're, 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 you extend us 54 uh, minutes? The kids are back there. You want to ask them? <laughs> so, yeah, they'll, they'll stay. That, they'll do, they'll do, Latin Latin till, uh, they'll do Latin until 4. I, I, I get that. Um, and some of the programming. Um, and the one other thing I'd say is um, going from some 25 minute blocks on the Tuesdays that you're having mm -hmm. now to a consistent 53 minute block, um, the intention isn't to just do a, a 25 minute lesson twice, right? right? No. So some of what you're talking here is actually going to more project based learning, mm -hmm. more active learning, um, more predictable lesson planning. Mm -hmm. So. I think the expectation is once the structure's in place, then some of the, um, the, um, 
the expectations or, or what your teachers are telling you, sort of what they're dying to do, that they would have more opportunity to exhibit in their classes. Is that, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but no, I'm No, I, I, I think that that's exactly um, what was, we, in, in order to expect that, we needed to have a structure to support that. And without a structure to support that, it's really hard to expect it. So um, over time, that's where we, we would like to move to, is, is provide at that time. And teams would still have time to be flexible with that, so that if there was an interdisciplinary project, they're all on team at the same time that they could work together and you know mix kids and, and do different things. So, so some of the, the benefits of the current schedule and, um, would continue to exist in, in the flexibility. Yeah, and um, I, the way middle school programming is, I would have a little bit of trouble Again, I'd have to see it, but having students say, I don't want to do a foreign language, I want to do something else, or mm -hmm. making some of those choices, because I, I just think they don't necessarily have an exposure to it yet, and I think middle just school... Just music and art. Just music and art, but I'm saying, I, I just think we... Um, I, I think we would... There's some benefit to having students struggle with some art and struggle with some music and, mm -hmm. to, and to have those um, experiences, um, because I think you can learn as much from... A no is a yes, and I think uh, kids have to learn some resilience in, in, as well. And I think you have to learn that through not being successful sometimes. So, um, in a certainly in a safe and healthy way, I have to say that I'll get in trouble, right? So, um, um, yeah. So I, again, Mrs. Ma, I, I think this is a this is a very scheduling is simple in one sense, but it's very complex in another, and that's an expression of values. And I think that's why those principles are, are so important. And if you, um, I would ask you just to spend some time on those principles. Uh, again, if you could maybe add one about the pullout, because if the committee um, changes their mind on a principle or doesn't want to support a principle, that's going to have then a ripple effect on the decisions that uh, folks can make um, here. If you don't care about the length of lunch, we can grab another um, Five should be a full hour. Right. So again, we can have lunch be an hour. We can have, we can have uh, a su sunny every day. We can have uh, we, we can do a lot of that stuff. But uh, I just I, at some point it's it's going to require some um, some choices. And then I just want again we're, we've focused a lot on the student part of this, mm -hmm. but I do um, want to make sure that we're also talking about some of the the um, teacher experiences mm -hmm. as well. And I think. Um, I think the existing schedule has some positives in it. It's not all negative, but I think the, some of the positives are the um, the adult, the team time that that has been allowed, and that we can have some uh, consistency towards. And I think that's an important part of um, an important part of that that middle school and those relationships that are, um, are that are developed. So um, I haven't talked to many parents who said, "Oh, please keep the current schedule," either. So um, I just think we we're we're going to need to make some changes. I do think the commitment should be that we're not going to keep, if we make a change, it's, we're not saying it's, um, you know, it's going to concrete and not change for, you know, decades. I think we're going to have to study it and look at it, and um, there are going to be some limitations to it. I guess I don't have to say that. I appreciate that you try to, to stay within your staffing levels because, um, Having just gone through the budget process, there was really no room for any uh, um, um, additional um, staffing needs. But again, if there's a guiding principle that makes the schedule work better for all kids, that drives the need for a position, then I'm saying then I think the, we're defining the need, and then we can then advocate for that position mm -hmm. as a result. So I mean, I think that would be something that we can look at. All right. So one thing that um, came up between this. The, both sides of this mm -hmm. conversation was um, the way that it's currently, the, the special ed pullouts are currently being done, I don't think is the right way. And so I'm hopeful that as you work into this new schedule, you will find a way that doesn't um, take um, kids that need pullouts of special ed out of subjects they might otherwise enjoy. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I, I do want to give people a chance in the sorry. auditorium mm -hmm. so that it's, it, I know there are people in the back. Do you want to speak on this? So who? It just you can pull up a chair. You don't have to move. You guys can just pull up a chair and um, or as many as you want and say what you want to say. And just introduce yourselves as you go along and. Um, very 
My name is Megan Nowojczyk. I'm co-president of the Burlington CPAC. I'm Amy Johnson. I'm the secretary and the treasurer for Burlington CPAC. I'm Beth Colburn. I'm the membership chair for the Burlington CPAC. And I'm Elizabeth Mello. I am also co-president of the Burlington CPAC. So the Burlington CPAC, for anyone who doesn't know, is the Special Education SE Parent Advisory Council. Is that right? Yes. yes. Is that right? Uh, used to be, Burlington used to be just the PAC, but um, now they've sort of changed the name a little bit to be like other communities, and it's taking me a little while to get used to it, but go ahead. I guess it falls on me. Um, so, I mean, I think I think the committee got a letter from the CPAC as well as um, um, the administration at the middle school, um, and I think we are in works in kind of sitting down together as a group and kind of talking to what our concerns are. Um, primarily, you know, I think you, Christine, you, you hit it. It's uh, it's related to making sure that our special ed kids are not having, you know, not missing out on extracurriculars to receive services and I, I know that choices have to be made at some time, some points and I have a child who does you know re receive services during you know developmental reading instead of foreign language and that was a decision we had to make not necessarily a great one um, and I guess you know just because we've had to do it I'm not sure that that's what we should be doing I suppose so I guess I look at like aspiring to the best kind of model um, and you know, I want to say, you know, I do want to say I appreciate all the work that's gone into this because I know a lot of work went into this. I saw, um, I went through I think 25 slides pretty diligently um, at home, and I saw how much work went into it. I think from our perspective, I think we want to put ourselves out there as a resource um, and make sure that um, when things like this come up, uh, that we are thought about as like a group of parents that are willing to kind of put our two cents in. I think it's easy for us to come in at the tail end and kind of, ooh, you didn't do this, you didn't, you know, but I don't think we, and I think we're trying to appreciate the work that went into that and not be, um, you know, kind of like tearing it apart, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think there, there is opportunity and I think there is, there are gonna have to be some difficult decisions. Um, I think where we stand, as many of us on this group or the active parents in the CPAC, um, I think that we feel like We'll advocate strongly for our children. I think we're a little concerned and part of our role as CPAC is to advocate for all children in district. Um, and so I think one of our challenges is pa educating parents to know what is and isn't permissible or what they can ask for um, and you know, making sure that that's, but also asking the district to really consider that. Um, and I think you know, we have a plan to kind of sit down. Um, did I cover everything? I don't, I'm sure I didn't. <laughs> A couple of things. Um, I think the concern is that there should be some sort of intervention and f or flex study hall. I know your objective to shorten the time that you have now, but if your children are going to miss out on foreign language or art or music, then you start running into walking a very fine line of violating their FAPE and IDA, and then you'll end up with OCI complaints, and nobody here wants that. Nobody wants it for their kids, nobody wants it for the district because it just creates problems. But if the children aren't able to access the same curriculum that all the other kids are able to access, that's going to be a problem for a lot of parents. We've already fielded complaints from parents in general. I mean, the current schedule is pretty atrocious. Um, it's very all over the place. It's not conducive to efficient learning. So I'm glad and we're very thankful that it has been redeveloped. But I think you really need to consider putting in that flex spot because I have a student who is requiring eight or nine pullouts a week over the five day schedule and moving to a six day model you're going to have to redo every single child in the middle school's IEP 504 including out of district placements to accommodate a six day schedule. That's a huge undertaking and you've only got one team chair. So how is that going to work with the six-day model that you're proposing? It's not a bad idea, it's just when it comes to special education, that presents a pretty big problem. So I guess it's trying to fine-tune the things and figure out you know, what isn't, isn't going to work as far as all the students' needs, not just the majority of students' needs, and finding that happy balance. But I just 
don't think the current schedule proposed is really going to do that without affecting their ability to access the full curriculum. Can I interject here that it might be a good idea for all of you to have a meeting about this in the near future and yeah. discuss these details mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. be, you know before you actually finalize everything. Mm -hmm. um, I, I um, responded and asked for times and dates, and we'll be great. As yeah, that's awesome. as we can. together yeah. now. As parents of kids okay. with special needs, I think one thing we want to have in general is to know that when you're making any change like this, this is a huge change, when you're making small changes that you're thinking about um, students of kids with special, the, mm -hmm. kids on IEPs, how will this affect them? Um, even seeing this presentation, my son's in kindergarten, I'm not here, I don't want to be here yet, <laughs> but I'm thinking, I didn't see anything saying, oh, we talked to special ed teachers, we talked to the director, um, not saying you didn't, but um, I want to know that it got thought of in the early side, not in the, in the back end. So, and, and I appreciate that, and I, I, you know, two things that I'd like to say is one is that um, families, so I, I don't want it to, to appear that we, we excluded the CPAC um, in terms of, of getting feedback. Um, certainly, you know, could have involved and, and reached out sooner, and I apologize for that. Um, but our first presentation to families really, um, except for our, our school council, was I think two weeks ago. Um, so in terms of, of the educators and, and the, the folks who um, have been working on this, um, in terms of we're special educators, um, a number of special educators were included in our faculty advisory committee, um, and there have been parallel conversations going around um, alongside around programming for, for students. So I'm um, looking at establishing an autism program, looking at um, um, kind of redefining our language-based program to be a true inclusive language-based program. So there have been many conversations over the course of the year um, I would say parallel conversations to the schedule conversation. So um, your your students, your I mean, I, I think of all children, um, and I don't necessarily think of you know special ed in this that that is a priority. I think it's our responsibility to meet the needs of all students. So um, please know, and as you get to know me, that those those pieces are always in on the conversation, even if it's not explicitly stated. That's always the piece. I will also say that as we start the the scheduling process because even though this hasn't been approved yet, we've started scheduling because we're, we're a little bit behind. Um, we're actually looking at students um, on IEPs um, first, um, which has not been done in the past before. Um, so that we are really looking at making sure that their needs are met through the schedule um, and through the grouping practices before we kind of you know, um, schedule the rest of the students. So I look forward to, to finding a time where we can all sit down um, and happy. I know that people work and that's tough, happy to to kind of you know make it later in the day too. So, yeah. so one thing to say, I think that you know, listening to your presentation, you guys address consistency a lot, and addressing inconsistency a lot, and I think that students on IEPs with social emotional issues, autism, whatever the the issue may be, need consistent access to their peers and unstructured social times, and taking them out of these opportunities in art or music where they can collaborate with children that are in their local community and build social capital with people that they will be growing with throughout high school and even in junior high is incredibly important and I think that that really needs to be focused upon. So I trust that you will um, have a meeting, work mm -hmm. all this out. Do, I'm sure you, you're, um, you've given it a lot of thought already and you have been trying to figure out what to do with the um, the issues around mm -hmm. all of this, it's a huge problem. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to thank you. Uh, is there anyone else in the audience or anywhere who wants to speak? John, John? go ahead. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Uh, so on, on ways and means, we spend a lot of time looking for problems. Uh, so it, it's not often that um, I'm speaking as a parent now. Uh, that, that we get to say something good. Uh, so, so I wanted to take that opportunity. Uh, I had a, a couple of children go through middle school a number of years ago. Uh, and my first reaction to this, uh, in looking at what you've done, uh, the simplest way to determine if something seems like a good plan is you look at it and say, of course, that looks so obvious. It's, you know, why haven't we done that all along? And that, that was absolutely my reaction to what, what you presented. Uh, having the, the consistency, having the blocks all be a reasonable length uh, is huge in my mind. I, from an educator's point of view, I can't imagine how you would ever build 
a lesson plan working with that old schedule. Uh, so even even if the times were shorter, the quality of the times are so much more significant mm -hmm. that I think we would come out ahead. And, and as you indicated, it looks like the, the instruction time is actually the same. Uh, doing all that and keeping the staffing levels consistent uh, is remarkable. Uh, having music be in a standard block, I think, is a great idea. I think having the uh, you know, the, the reporting being reduced slightly, I think, is a fine change. It's still plenty of reporting that's going on. Uh, the consistency of every day being the same uh, just makes so much sense to me. Uh, and I, my, while I'm not as familiar with the, the IEPs and special ed, my suspicion is the consistency in the plan and the size of the blocks will make it vastly easier to work uh, work the IEPs into the schedule as opposed to trying to fit it into what I can only describe as the current cockamamie schedule. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I just can't see how that wouldn't be easier relative to what you must be going through now trying to fit it into these no two things the same schedule between teams or day to day or class to class. Uh, so. I, I, it seems like the opportunity is certainly there that it, it, it should be it should be easier in theory uh, and I would also encourage you on the, uh, the math level idea I think was great uh, you know I think for those students that are operating at a more advanced level the, the current math curriculum really causes them to tread water a fair amount uh, so I think the idea of the opportunity for those that want to to combine the seventh and eighth grade and, and you know, have that effectively extra year put in uh, it is a great idea. Uh, so, um, so I, I think you've done a fabulous job. Is there anyone else? Yes. Am I actually a student, not a parent? That's okay. Come on up and grab the microphone. <laughs> I came to this meeting with the purpose for like Boy Scouts. I need to get a, a few merit badges done and I need to observe a school committee meeting or some meeting of you sorts. You picked a good one. <laughs> yeah, I did. Is it totally fascinating? <laughs> yeah. You get all your hours. It's fascinating, but like kind of lengthy. But yeah, it's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't expect myself to actually like talk in any of this. I thought I was going to observe. But then seeing, since I am a student currently, and I was actually in the middle school like three years ago. And then also I went to Foxville Elementary School. So I like, and even though I haven't like talked to like the new principals in either school since I went when they were the previous principals. I think it's really cool that they're trying to introduce a new schedule and like a new way of learning. Because I have a cousin who actually is in Fox Hill. She's a first grader, Isabel from Lazardo. Uh, and this would impact her and the future. Like, since you have a child in kindergarten, that would impact them. And I like the idea of fi figuring out long term answers rather than short term answers that would work for now and then create bigger problems later. Because I feel that not only in this like world, but like in all other communities, that's what most people try to think of. Get it solved now, and then worry about what happens later, rather than worry about what happens later, and then try to get to that. So I think that's really important. Um, the, I remember, actually, in middle school, we would always be rushed, since like in between classes we don't have to hurry, because like you said, there are no designated times. You need to times. teleport, you just need to do like a Star Trek thing. <laughs> yeah. And then, like, I remember there would be, like, locker times. Like, Disney, like, five-minute locker times. And then they'd be, like, they'd be, like, you got to get going. And they would always remind us, saying, like, in high school, you wouldn't really have this. And I was, like, that's true, because I'm in high school. I just go to, I just have a bag with me all the time, which I believe is actually easier. And everything's on my iPad, so I don't have to carry, like, too much. So I think that, especially when it comes to, like, I was in Beam. I was in D-Block Math. I, like... It, I guess now that I'm thinking about it, there, I would always miss a certain day every week, so I'd probably miss like one long, like I'd probably never get like long science ever in that year, probably, I don't remember. 
but that probably happened. And then, so it's cool that like now with the block is rotating, kind of like my high school schedules blocks, mm -hmm. you'll be able to get that experience. And like, I remember always, I'm pretty sure I remember this. I don't exactly remember it, but <laughs> I remember in the morning, like if I had like a certain class I didn't really like, like I'd be like, oh, I have to deal with this like every morning. Or like especially if it was like a Monday morning, it'd be like the worst. Mm -hmm. Um, but like with this, it would be like easier because then you get to see that different type of personality. Like my teachers comment, like in high school, they're like, oh, this isn't your morning, right? Like, or like, I wish I had you in the afternoon, you're more active. And then I think like not to like get, give a solution or present a solution for you guys. I think maybe if you had like a single like, like non rotating block and you just had your children like go during that block. So every day they would miss like something different that they would need to. I'm not like trying to like solve all your problems, but it's just like an idea I was thinking of. Because if they don't, if your guys don't move, you would miss everything equally in theory. Like all of this is in theory, because like, like people were presenting, like snow days happen, everything happens. My dad actually works like in the school system, so I get like a little bit of an insider <laughs> point of view. So it's crazy to see how like even though like I didn't even think about like the teacher side or like the mm -hmm. students because I'm a student I don't think about like what like the parents weigh in and like how their own children have different issues like I remember mm -hmm. in English I would have to deal with well not like deal with like that's a poor choice of words for, like, um <laughs> I would have another student in my class who was like in your program or like special needs and then we would have the teacher's assistant in there and like they would do their part or like um and like try to help them out but also try to help out the whole class i was like with classes like even though there's one teacher like if you do like group work the teacher has to like bounce around so if there's even a teacher assistant who's mostly like for the special needs kids i would still help it and help the other groups and like kind of help the teacher so i think that's like a cool like where was i going with this <laughs> um with the special needs kids in relation to that it was like cool to see how even though they were able, they were still even though I had the help, they were still able to have a normal student life for the most part. Mm -hmm. And like, I remember my friends, I was like, oh, why are we in this class? And then, oh, I was in this little room, like the help room. And it was like, and I was like right next to like one of my English classes. So I'd always see them and like wait for them in the halls. And like, they would just like be doing whatever they need to do. And then, like, yeah, so. So you burned your badge. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you for your contributions. And, um, yeah, and Diana, did you want to say something just and then we're going to wrap this just up? Just keep it short. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to um, address one or two items. Um, one is, I, as the union president, have been getting a lot of concern just about the, the speed at which this has been put together. Um, I understand that the schedule has not changed for a very long time and that there's a desire to, and that there's a displeasure with the old schedule, but I think um, one of the concerns that I'm hearing isn't so much that they don't, that members are, um, don't believe that the, a good schedule put together, but rather that they're unsure of what's coming up, of what it is. But um, primarily I just want to come as representative of my members to address concerns around foreign language, around world language. And that is simply, while it's understood that the minutes will be the same or actually greater, um, the concern is that by not having a class every day, um, that this is, this is especially where you're looking at sixth grade where it's two out of every six. Mm -hmm that you don't get that consist consistent practice. Yes, you're getting enough minutes and that's wonderful, but the concern is that, you know, from Monday to Thursday um, in a beginning language, uh, there's, it can be difficult to carry it over. And so the request has been from, uh, from world language teachers to perhaps take another look at this and see if there is some way to create um, a more frequent meeting. So I'd just like to put that put that out there. I know that some districts have more meetings, more time, some have fewer. Um, we just want to make sure that when our students head up here from the middle school to the high school, they're ready to engage in that level two of their language. 
uh, and that is, I think, the primary concern, is that whether or not uh, the way in which it is laid out will give students an opportunity to get the kind of proficiency that allows them to move on to high school and further in a second language. Thank you. Um, Ms. Purchase and, and Mr. Murphy, I want to personally thank you for being so willing to work so hard on this and to listen tonight to everybody. Um, you know, you, you did an awesome presentation and then there are various ones of us that have special interests and issues and um, it, was, it was very it was very good of you to, to be so willing to listen to everything, meet with the special ed parents, and, and take it all into consideration as you move forward on this. And, and I know that you're in a short time frame because you have to get ready for next year. Mm -hmm. So um, we really do appreciate all the work you're doing on this and, and especially the listening part. That's, that's, that's what we're here for. This was not, again, nothing that we wanted to, to kind of go forward. I, I do feel strongly, um, yes, it's a short time frame. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that the process was a thorough process, though, um, and we'll continue to, um, to, to work together. And even, even if and when this, you know, is, is kind of um, passed, um, hopefully, um, th that doesn't mean that it's going to be in place for the next 46 years. I right. think that at that point in time, we <laughs> that was the last sketch. That, <laughs> that we will we will each year look at it and determine what's working and what's not, and make those adjustments. Um, so I think that this is is going to be an ongoing process. Right. So thank, thank you. you very much for all of your work. No, thank you. Uh, Carrie and, and Josh and the students that I think were outstanding too. What what a Thank you. Great accomplishments. So. Thank you. Innovations Pathways Grant, Dr. Thompson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to turn over to Patrick for the Innovation Pathways Grant conversation. I believe Dr. Conkey received a letter um, last week, at the end of the week, notifying us that we received a $50,000. Innovation Pathways Grant for the 2019-2020 school year. And um, the letter came from our commissioner, uh, Jeff Riley. He said, we are confident that your district's new innovation pathway will offer students a transformative experience, enabling them to develop essential skills, gain awareness of future career opportunities, and make more informed choices about post-secondary education in promising fields. So prior to this year, there were 16 districts that had Innovation Pathways grants. I'm not sure of the number um, for, added this year, but again, we're a very small number of districts in the state that have received this. And um, really, just uh, want to mention Shireen Terrell's work um, in this area, um, connecting us with partners to make this grant a possibility. Um, and certainly, I know uh, Mr. Wong at the high school, and I don't want to leave anybody out. It's been a um, again, led by Shireen, but uh, a lot of people have contributed to this, so. So uh, the point of tonight was just to announce the school committee, we'll share the letter with you. We'd like to um, bring the team in uh, to discuss the Innovation Pathways. It's actually, it's a very significant um, accomplishment. We're one of a few districts to do this. Our area of focus is in computer science, um, and it just takes a tremendous amount of effort to coordinate uh, not only the classroom learning piece, but there's always there's an internship and an outside um, learning piece and coupling this with the internships that are currently happening. So there's a lot of exciting things happening with the Innovation Pathways um, program. And it's, um, um, I think what the state is ultimately going to do is try to model some of these successful pathways and then replicate and expand them uh, across the state. So it's sort of our opportunity to do that. I know Mark and the high school are also working on some scheduling changes, and so I know how much you enjoy these scheduling conversations. Um, but uh, I think Mark at some point would um, probably should come in and tell you about sort of what he's thinking about and um, some of the changes that um, he's working on with his faculty. Um, like Carrie and Josh have worked on with, with their with their faculty and staff. So um, I think uh, that will happen. So again, tonight was just meant to be the announcement. We'll share the letter. But we'd love to have the people who did all the work associated with this. And again, it was outstanding uh, work. And it was a, um, it's quite an honor. And again, Shireen led the effort. She's our computer science teacher here at the, at the high school. Any comments from the committee? Thanks. Yeah, congratulations. 
And the next item? Um, uh, new Vectory Garden Manager. Um, I think we included a letter in your packet. Um, and there was a request at the end of the letter that um, that uh, Dr. McKinnich sent to you. Um, again, I didn't think there would be a problem, but um, she wanted to explore the opportunity to expand the garden by planting some fruit trees, and she asked permission to bring a proposal to the school committee. And again, I didn't see, we're sort of going to, once we get through the budget time, again, I was going to Sharon add her to the agenda so she could present a fruit tree proposal uh, to the committee. And no nuts, just fruit. <laughs> so we can do that. We're all sitting behind yes. the table. Um, <clears throat> that sounds good. Any comments? Any discussion? That's mm -hmm. fine. Um, Summer schedule? Uh, Sharon put together some dates. She looked through a lot of everyone's uh, calendars and she's proposing um, July 23rd and August 20th. 723 and 820? Yes, ma'am. Everybody okay with that? Yeah. Okay. So Sharon will have those as proposed dates. Old business? Anyone have any old business? Nope. New business? Um, Financial update. Financial update. Um, it was all emailed to you, Sharon. You have some paper copies over there for the folks who need it. Ms. Kasha is at the State um, Business Managers um, Conference, which is in, um, I think it's in Hyannis um, right now. So I will uh, do the update. Then Ways and Means, you received this um, yesterday, I think. Um, the days are blurring together. Uh, Monday is, I think, when you received it. Today's, today's Tuesday, so that makes sense. Um, so again, the format you're very familiar with, um, the um, first two pages of the operating budget, um, encumbered and, and remaining. Um, and then page three is the accommodated budget, same format, spent, encumbered, and remaining. And then uh, the important pages to me are actually the last three, which are the um, projected budget, operating, and projected budget um, accommodated. So if you turn to page five, again, which is, I honestly start at page five when I look at these reports. Um, the, um, in the projected budget, uh, given sort of where we are and where we need to get to, um, Nicole's projecting about $100,000 um, balance at this point in the year. Again, um, Ms. Aragon, I know you're gonna ask me, am I comfortable with that? As I said, no, I'm not gonna be comfortable until, um, um, the middle to end of July, so when it closes out, um, but um, better um, positive than negative, and so um, I think that's where we're tracking. Um, on the accommodated account, um, again on page six, um, we're, um, again our position is, is um, still positive, and again, that could change at any time, given it's the accommodated account, but we're still um, projecting that we will uh, finish the fiscal year um, to, the, to the positive. Um, I know sometimes looking in isolation, $100,000 can seem like a lot, but given the size of our budget, it's, um, um, it's not. So, uh, so again, I, um, I hope as we, as we um, bring this along, I think there was some feedback from Ways and Means when this was emailed to you and from the school committee um, about um, making sure that we are um, more predictable and regular. Um, our intentions are to do, and our commitment are to do monthly financial updates. And um, I think the suggestion was made, which I believe is a good one, that we are going to honor moving forward is to decouple the creation of these reports from the school committee schedule. So. Um, Again, what we are going to propose moving forward, and again, Nicole and I had a, a, a email communication about this, was we're going to, um, at the end of the month, um, look at the week following the end of the month, if I'm saying that right, the first week of the month. So after a month ends, that first week, producing um, uh, a financial report like this, and then not worry about when we have the school committee. We'll just distribute that, and then we can put the financial report um, either on the first agenda or the second agenda, but people have the information at the same time uh, each month. 
So I'd like some flexibility in terms of the meeting that month just because something may come up. We may get late into agenda or something like that, but people will have the information. And obviously, if there's an issue, it would be a priority on, on, the, um, on the agenda. So um, that would be my um, commitment uh, to both Ways and Means and, and to the committee. Questions? So I just want to clarify. So that first week um, will be emailed these financial reports. Mm -hmm. And Ways and Means subcommittee will also mm -hmm. be emailed at the same time. Yep. OK. And then um, it will appear if we need to discuss something that will happen at a meeting. But as an agenda item, FY19 financial update, we won't necessarily see it. No, it'll be at every, every month. It will be on the agenda, right, okay. Eric? No, well, okay. no, I'm, I'm shifting this slightly. So I think what we, the commitment we made, which we, which we have to do a better job of keeping, is we said the second meeting of every month, we would have this information. We were trying to get it done so it was the most up to date for that meeting. Mm -hmm. The challenge is there are some months where we only have one meeting and so and then some months when if we're trying to get through budget hearings right. or we have a special school committee meeting, I think so having it attached to the school committee meeting I think was just causing some confusion. So people will get the report that first week of the month, mm -hmm. every month. Um, Again, I, I think that we can either put it on that first agenda, which is typically the second week of, of the month, or the second agenda. It'll be discussed that month. All I'm saying is I'd like some flexibility as to the first or, or the second. It may not be on every agenda. November, we typically have one meeting. Obviously, it will be on the agenda for that one meeting in November. So we're, what we're trying to say is you should sort of expect it that first week of the month after the month closes out. I'm not sure whether it would be on the... I'm not going to commit to the day because it all depends when, what day of the week, the month ends, but it will be sort of the week following. We rarely, if ever, have a school committee meeting in that first week anyway, so it will just be, again, decoupled from the meeting. It is, I hope I said that well, but I think that's what I'm trying to do. Thank you. Um, so we'll go from there. Um, Other questions? John, you have anything? John. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Dr. Connie. That, that's great. Uh, and it, that's exactly what we'd like to see is it, you know, it comes within a week of when the month ends and we discuss it, you know, as, as soon as we can at, at a uh, school committee meeting. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, just uh, want to just touch on two particulars in the, the current report. So I, I'm just comparing it to the March 5th uh, report, which is the last one we have. Uh, and so just to summarize, I think there's essentially only two significant changes. In the operating budget, the reduction uh, in surplus by 20K it is pretty much completely explained by the custodian vacation leave. Uh, and, you know, I can imagine how that could change over time. Uh, in the accommodated budget, it's the change from last time is actually an increase of about 70K in the surplus. Uh, and that seems to be pretty much entirely explained by the tuition line item going up by, you know, a little more than 10%, I guess. Uh, so I, or about 10%. So I, I was just curious about the tuition line item. It, it not knowing exactly how it works, I would have imagined that, you know, once people are in, the tuition would be fairly predictable. So I'm just curious how that went up by 70K since March. Um, I don't know the specific situation, but a, a placement could change um, to um, a, a less restrictive uh, environment. Maybe a, a change in placement may mean a change in tuition price. Um, it could be that a student turned 22 and maybe aged out of um, Services. It could be that we consolidated something. So again, it, it could be a change in an individual um, service or, or tuition cost. Okay. So uh, I'm, again, I don't know what this particular situation is. I'm not even sure if I did. I would say, but I think it could be a, a bunch of different options. Okay, that, that, that makes sense to you that that yes that could happen. Okay. Um, okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else on the financial report? Eileen, yes. you want to come up? Yes, thanks. Good evening. Eileen Sickler, um, town meeting member, precinct four. 
So I don't come here just for the numbers. I do learn a lot. This was very good. It was long, but it was good. Um, it happens. Yeah. So that's a great idea um, to have its own calendar. Super. So how does how, how does the public get to see the financials? Um, I mean, you pass them to Ways and Means and your own group, but then, um, I mean, do we wait until whatever the meeting is that they're, that they're discussed publicly, and then do we sort of nag people to, you know, we don't want to be emailing folks to, anyway, what, 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 what's the best? Um, honestly, it's, it's really up to, once it's done, um, it's really up to the school committee, so we can, I think we can, Post. It's really a public document when we meet and discuss it, so it becomes public at that point. Um, again, this means as a suggestion. I, um, I, if I have a, a, a preference and you know agree to these things, and I know you start to swim, but I <clears throat> I would prefer that when they are on our agenda, so that we've had a chance to look at them and, and digest them. And if there's anything that you want to bring to our attention about them you would have the opportunity to do that. I prefer it was on our agenda, then it's posted you know, with an agenda and Patrick can put it on the on the website or whatever, like it, like whatever we do with it, anything else that we present at a meeting. But um, I would <clears throat> I would prefer to do it that way rather than if it goes off if it goes out as soon as you wish it with the to the ways and means and there's something there that we even haven't had looking yet and I'm getting phone calls about it. Yeah, the way it's discussed. I, I just you know, for the for the sake of an extra day or two or a week, depending on the timing of it, I, I don't see where it's that big of a deal, but I, I just think we should have the opportunity as a group to have looked at it and discussed it to the degree that might be necessary. So far other than a question here or there, there's really not a lot to talk about typically anyway, but I, would, I just think we should have had a chance to look at it before we post. To that end, I would request that you put it on the first agenda whenever possible. Go ahead, Christy. I, I was going to echo what Mr. Murphy said, just based on the, um, for example, I forget <coughs> which meeting it was, there was that transportation cost of, of upwards of almost 100000 that right. that hit. Um, that was kind of shocking and, and to have the business office fielding those emails immediately before I, I honestly don't get to look at it sometimes the same day I get it um, before that we've had that and then to have that discussion of follow-up is this something we need to be concerned with or just to give the business office some preparation before they are publicly answering a lot of questions and yes, because yeah. there is there can be those swings if it's you know minor it, it's not a big deal but those months we do have such a swing I, I would defer to what mr. Murphy said but having it on that first agenda so you're, you're not waiting yeah you know, and, and again I just want to Stress again, we're, right. we're decoupling from, I don't want to say first right. or second right. agenda, right. we're saying the first week of the month, we'll have the numbers to the committee. Right. And then when it's on the agenda, it'll be public information at that point. Sharon, you typically send the agenda out to almost everybody. Mm -hmm. um, meeting. So um, everyone will get the agenda at that point, and then mm -hmm. we can distribute and sort of um, get the information out. Um, after it's on the agenda, is that what I'm hearing? Mm -hmm. That would be my preference. Yes. So. Well, now we just say, uh, you know, when you can, try to aim for the first agenda so that people have the opportunity to, to see the numbers if they can. I'm absolutely hearing you. I'm yeah. just trying to. <laughs> yeah, say that, you, know, you want to keep your. Right. You want to keep your. We're, we're going to have a separate, uh, a separate schedule, and um, right. I, I, I understand that. On the other hand, maybe we shouldn't post them. We should just ask everyone to come to the meeting. No, <laughs> I think we can. <laughs> <laughs> but then we have people talking about other so, agenda um, items. It's nice. <laughs> um, let's see how it works. And again, I'm certainly open to feedback. So if you're, if again, obviously, if, if you want to see a change, you're welcome to come in and speak to the committee, and I'll do it on poll. Reviewing is always good. So just to be clear, so then it will be posted on the website the night of the meeting, where it's going to be discussed. Yeah. Okay. I think we'll we'll try to get everything up and. That's great. Okay.
I've been ready. Okay, thank you. You bet. Okay. Um, so is that it? Any other questions on the financial report? I just I don't know if we've said it yet, but we refer to how we approved our budget last mm -hmm. evening. I yes. just want to thank Ways and Means for all of their assistance and their oversight, and I want to thank the town meeting members for once again being um, generous to the students of the town of Burlington. Thank you. Thank you. All the time and energy. Yes, so far so good. We've had our budget approved and one Warren article, and we're hopeful to uh, get the rest of the remaining Warren articles approved in the next meeting. Patrick put together a, a nice video, um, and we just didn't have the time to show it. It wasn't, um, we, we got derailed a little bit during the presentation, but uh, when we get through through town meeting, we discussed uh, sending it out with a thank you to town meeting members, just uh, give them a brim sort of a brief glimpse of some of the accomplishments of the of the district this year. So uh, so we'll do that, certainly include you in that. But uh, again, I share Mr. How Murphy's long is it? appreciation and gratitude. Five, minutes. Three minutes. I just wonder if you might not want to still present it at town meeting. Um. No? As to, uh, I don't know. Uh, how long is it? As town meeting Four goes minutes. along with the... It's less than that. No, I, again, I think... All right, and we're looking think, at well, Monday night. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I just, End of story. I just think we want to. Thank you, town meeting members. We appreciate your help, Thank your support, your money. Um, the next item is elementary student report cuts. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Um, again, we've discussed this uh, many times. Currently, elementary student report cards are distributed three times per school year, and there's one parent conference held in the fall. Um, we're recommending that this be changed to two report cards, that would be mid-year and end of year, and um, have the opportunity for two parent conferences, fall and spring. Parent conferences would be held in November and March, and again, the report cards would be issued in January and June, and the proposed change would be effective for the 2019-2020 school year. Uh, Mrs. Monaco, you said you were interested in hearing from uh, teachers and parents, and so Patrick um, reached out to teachers and parents with um, a survey, I guess, or a Google form. Yeah. And so, you know, how many responded? We got uh, 319 responses. Okay. So there were 242 parents and 77 teachers, and out of that total, 83% um, um, supported the change closer to 84 um, percent but with a caveat because um, a lot of the teachers and a few of the parents responded that it was difficult to really give an all-in without knowing what the format of that second conference day would be there, were there was some concern about that how that would be structured so that's something we're gonna have to plan and have discussions with, about um, if we make that change is this an item you want voted on um, yeah, I'd like to get the principals involved and sort of have them think about how to how to schedule it. I think we had um, knocked around some different ideas. I think whether the uh, second conference is um, optional or required was, was an idea. There are many teachers already giving a second conference um, in the spring. And um, we talked about maybe um, having an evening, um, we have some contractual hours available and maybe having some of the time scheduled in the evening for the parents who can't make the conferences during the day in the fall. So I think we have some options. I just wanted to have principals again go through their leadership teams and put some structure to it. But I just wanted to move forward with the uh, two and two. Tom. To get it on the table, I'll make a motion that uh, the school committee approve the uh, suggested elementary student report card change as described by the superintendent. Second. Sorry. Okay. Is there any discussion? Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm going to support it. I, Patrick's uh, report just um, influenced me to a certain degree. It's, um, uh, I mean, I tend to look to administration on these types of things, and then um, uh, they're recommending it, and the amount of people that's uh, responded to the survey, that you know, the great majority of those seem to be okay with it. Uh, <coughs> I'm going to vote to support. Kristen? Um, I guess I'd 
keep going back and forth with this. I'm one of the proponents that really feel there should be a second conference. That I was saddened when that second conference faded away between my first and my youngest. Um, and I guess what concerns me in the way this is written is the opportunity for two parent conferences. If we go down to two report cards, I don't want just to then go back to one conference. Um, the whole point of tailing back the two report cards is really to give that face-to-face -face opportunity and, and have that discussion, that fluid discussion where you're you're not in an email going back and forth. You, you One thing leads to another, and you end up having a more holistic conversation about a child. And you're, you're going into that classroom. There's a lot more dynamics when you're going into that classroom. You tell the child, I mean, with your teacher today, anything I should know. Uh, the teacher and the parent builds that, that rapport. It's always easier to have that email after or that telephone conference after you've had that face-to-face -face conference with with um, the teacher. So I guess I want more clarity on what opportunity means. Well, I think you can make more clarity. You're saying you'd like there to be two report cards and two parent conferences. Yes. We can't force parents to attend. I Correct. guess that's what I meant by the opportunity Correct. is uh, the expectation, though, you would like to say the expectation is that there are two conferences for every parent who wants to have the two conferences. And, and they don't have to go soliciting it. So, you know, my experience with other parents have been, well, I don't want to bother the teacher. I said, no, there's, you, you can always meet with the teacher, have a second. And, um, you know, oh, well, I'll just email. I don't want to take their time. and and. So I, I don't want to fall back on the parent to be the one to be initiating a second conference. Okay. If that's clear. I, it is. Okay. Well, I am not going to support this. Um, I'm going to vote no because um, it, I think parents should have as many conferences as they feel that they want or need. And going to two report cards, um, I simply cannot support going to, I, I didn't like going to three report cards, and there's no way I'm going to support going to two report cards. Diana. One of the reasons that many of the teachers have supported the idea of going to two report cards is simply the feeling that um, having to have that report card ready for that first conference so early, uh, very often some of the benchmark testing has just been completed. Uh, very often elementary teachers have barely had a chance to really get to know their students, especially with uh, our current RTI structure. Uh, students don't remain in the same classroom throughout the day, and so you end up seeing your homeroom students perhaps only during science and social studies and perhaps the morning meeting. Um, I think there was a lot of uh, support for the idea of having that face-to-face, -face, of really being able to have that conversation, especially with a standards-based report card that can be fairly difficult to understand. Um, my concern, and the concern of the association, is how little um, planning or uh, work around how a second conference would happen. Um, currently, in the, the first conference, of course, it's back-to-back -back with a um, professional development day. All elementary schools have their parent-teacher conferences, middle school and high school have a professional development day, and then it flips, so students are out. There's a dedicated day. That does not mean that people don't, that teachers don't meet with parents at other times. First of all, as a fifth grade teacher, I met with a parent any time they wanted to meet and very often would reach out to have a conversation with them. Um, the concern here is that there's no uh, plan. There's been no proposal put forward as to how this would be implemented. As a fifth grade teacher, would I love to have a second conference? Would I love to have that kind of um, real connection around, as a partner with parents around their students' education? Absolutely. I think it's actually far more informative than a report card. 
uh, as, some, as a special education teacher, I actually much prefer to be able to actually address um, in a narrative how students were doing. My concern, however, is we have no idea how this would work out. Is there an expectation, if, if we're not having an early release day, if we're not having another, you know, backing it up to another professional development day, is the expectation that we will do this for a number of evenings or beforehand? Um, there was a comment made at one point about the fact that there are additional two, you know, a two hour uh, commitment that the could be activated in the contract. Um, clearly, um, there isn't a real understanding of how long it takes to get through um, even 18 parents um, worth of uh, conferences. Two hours is not going to make it. So it, now we're starting to talk about multiple evenings. Where, you know, this was very difficult to respond to the survey in anything other than just a, a philosophical manner. Philosophically, I think it shows that many people feel that going down to two report cards and having that additional contact time arranged with parents is a great idea. But how does one support it if you don't know anything about it, how it's going to happen? I think this was a real cart before the horse, quite frankly. I think that you have to be able to at least put forward one, two, three possibilities as to how it might come out and then be able to say, um, do you believe in it philosophically? Is this what you want? Here are some options. Please give feedback. Thank you. Okay. Just, I guess in response to that, there are some evenings in the contract that I know are not being utilized at different points. Yeah, and there's, there's so more than one, and principals have actually been working on this and talking about options with some of their staff, so I, I think um, they're, they're out there. I just, if it wasn't real, it didn't make sense to to do a whole lot more with this. I think if we're not going to do this, then we need to propose some changes in the calendar because the feedback was we need to move the fall conference um, later. So I just think that's what we're looking for is uh, if we'd like to pilot it for a year, uh, get some feedback, and parent, uh, principals continue to work on this with their teachers. And again, as many of the teachers said through their principals and to me directly, they're already having a second conference. And I just think, um, Moving to report cards would sort of honor that time that they're doing. And Mrs. Russo, I'm hearing you. You would like it to be more of an expectation mm -hmm. um, than sort of an option. And I just think we need to um, see what the principals come up with. Um, so where it says it would be effective 2019 and 20. So you mentioned pilot year. Mm -hmm. Could we put something in of that and then make sure that we then have this discussion in April again and get the feedback teachers, parents, or does it make sense just to leave this? No, I think we could should do that anyway and see what's happening. And then I'm not even against the idea of um, if we can't fit it in or the, or the spring is too busy or we can't put the evenings together that we talk about adjusting the schedule um, again and then make mid-year and then again next year is a a contract year anyway, and maybe we have to talk about uh, the structure of the second conference day or something like that. But I just think we, we need to, um, we made this change in kindergarten, so I think it's been effective there. I don't think you've gotten calls from um, kindergarten, and Mrs. Russo, you're one of the driving reasons that we're looking at a second conference. So again, if this um, is not a direction the committee wants to go, then I, I, we have other changes to, to, to make. In the, in the calendar. And, and I understand this has to be real, but I didn't want to, again, I think the principals have been having these conversations, and, and I think they're, they're, they'll we'll bring something to you that is um, some proposal once the principals, I think, have the idea that they can move forward with this. So um, are you confident you want to vote on this? A, the full committee is here, and B, it sounds like it really hasn't been fully developed. Are you ready for a vote? Again, I think it's more fully developed um, at the buildings level. Okay. If you want to wait for a full committee, you can do no, that. That's I would just sort of then, if you don't want to vote officially, if you say, go ahead, tell everyone this is the direction that we're going to go, and you're confident that uh, we can get the vote, then I will have principals 
develop sort of for March a concrete schedule. And I think they can work with their grade level teams to do that. No, if you're really going in that direction, I want my vote recorded. So if you're ready for a vote. And I have no problem amending the motion to say for, as a pilot for next year, if, if that would make people feel more comfortable. But yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, I think that would be a, a good thing. And that way, if we have to go back to three report cards or the, or the conference comes across as not something that's required or we don't feel like we can fit in the time or um, again there could be lots of different reasons not to change but I think there's some good reasons to change as well. Okay if there's no further discussion we'll put the motion to a vote. All those in favor? Aye. I am opposed. It is uh, two to one. Thank you. Thank you. Huh? <laughs> something that's uh, not unanimous. Not unanimous. <laughs> it happens. Okay. Um, Administration of medication, first reading. Um, there, the next two are connected and they came through the wellness committee. Is that correct, Patrick? Yeah, and then we ran at the wellness committee last And week. so, Patrick, I'll let you give some background, but I just wanted to make the distinction between C and D. C is a policy, um, and D is the automatic external defibrillator. We needed to make some changes in the procedures and protocol. So, I'm Eric, not I don't have this. Where did it Some of the um, I, Yeah, it wasn't in mine. Scroll down for there's some gaps. There's some gaps. I think I was relying on your, How do you, um, your expertise with this. This is the first reading, anyway. So. Oh, it's, it's a first reading? Yeah. No. The key change in the administering medicine to students, um, it cut out some language that allowed a school secretary to um, call a student to the office and remind them to take medicine if the nurse wasn't present. Um, and we cleaned that up and said no one other than the school nurse may give or administer any medication to any student unless the unlicensed staff attended it as the, the appropriate training course that is required by the DPH. So there's a, there's a training course required by the Department of Public Health to dispense medication, and we just thought that language um, could potentially cause some problems, so Barbara cleaned that up. Okay, thank you. So we don't need a vote on this because it's a first reading. Correct. Okay, next. Is the automatic external defibrillator procedures and protocols. Again, probably, again, in hindsight, I should have put this under um, communication, not asking for a vote because it's just a procedure and protocol. But um, um, Ms. Conley, through the wellness committee, wanted to make some changes in those procedures. I just wanted to inform the committee what those changes are. Yeah, the policy is staying the same, so I'm not asking you to vote on that. Ms. Monica, we'll make sure you get a, a copy of the first reading of the... Of the yeah, I, I didn't, I just didn't see it on the electronic agenda. <coughs> Maybe I should look on my computer instead of my iPad. Um, so is that it? Anything else to come before the committee? No, ma'am. No one for the public participation. What, Diane? You're going to town, huh? I wasn't going to speak tonight. You guys have ruined it for me. I you can come up one. afterwards, okay? Thank what? You. This lady's in the back. Of the oh, I'm sorry. I, no, that's didn't, okay. I didn't realize you guys were coming up again. You take it. Are you sure? Diana. Yes. Are you sure? It's okay. Let me make this real short, and that is regarding the um, conference plans. Um, it sounds as though this is being been um, sent off to the principals, and we're looking at various building-based uh, uh, proposals. I am officially, publicly, um, demanding that when whatever is uh, developed and put forth to those buildings, uh, that it is forwarded to the BEA so that we can assess any possible impact. Um, it is, I find it highly unusual that we are going forward with something with so little structure to it and so little information, and I think it's important that we have an opportunity um, to make sure we do our due diligence. Thank you. Thank you. And I don't demand often, do I? No. What up? Hi. 
Hi, thank you so much for taking our question. We are both parents um, of rising third graders at Francis Wyman. Oh, my why am I not surprised? <laughs> <laughs> my name's Courtney. Uh, I'm Kelly Power. I have um, twins at Francis Wyman, and I'd like to say that um, we've had a wonderful experience so far. We can't speak um, highly enough about how great the teachers are, Mrs. McDonald, the school itself, it's been great. Um, but we're here because we've been recently informed that they will no, um, not be adding the additional sixth class for our students next year. And we're, we just have concerns about what that means for our upcoming third graders um, and their teachers. I feel like they already have a large class as it is with the additional sixth classroom. And going down to five and adding more students to that class and um, we just wonder if they're going to be at a disadvantage compared to their peers in the rest of the community. This is um, next year, which grade? No. This is third, third grade. grade. <coughs> okay. In the handouts I moved, it's currently the, there's six sections of second grade, and we are modeling five sections at third grade. Say so going up to 21. Mm -hmm. From 21.2. There's probably 17, 18 now, I think, in your current. Yeah, I would say 19 I, or 20. I have 20. Have My daughter's now. class has 20. All right. I have usually grade level numbers. I don't have how they're all distributed through, so there might be a smaller class in there as well. So mm -hmm. I have um, currently 106 projected probably uh, around 106 second graders projecting 106 third grader for next year. How, how can there be a class? Uh, is, do you happen to know if there's a really small class somewhere in the mix? Not. Uh, between us, we she has a set of twins, so she has two, and then I have a daughter, so there's three, cl we're, we have three classes, and they're all large. Yes. So that would mean three other classes. I'm not quite sure, but I think they're on the same kind of. Yeah, they sound like they're similar. Yeah. Okay. You want to look into that a little? Yeah, these numbers from yesterday. So I, we're, I'm fairly confident. Again, I don't know how mm -hmm. the classes are distributed. It is a large class. So um, 106. Again, Francis Wyman is designed as a five section school. We, we did have that sixth. K one two, um, and we were trying to um, absorb it into um, grade three, similar to the other conversations about prioritizing the class sizes in K two. There are eighty three rising fourth graders with five sections. Again, we could certainly look at um, swapping, but uh, given the, what the um, the Grade three parents at Fox Hill and the grade three parents at Francis Wyman. Again, um, supporting your, uh, not arguing the the um, value of smaller of class sizes. I, I think I would like to support that, but um, we really would at this point need to go from 96 classroom teachers at the elementary level, again homeroom teachers to 98. We really need two additional two additional teachers. Two additional teachers. What's the um, what's the physical capacity over there? Is there um, well, they there. There's basically one room that's been floating. It's not in a great. Um, it's in a decent location for K two. It's not in a great location for for three five. But I mean, I think they have one spare space. One of the fifth grade classrooms isn't very. I'm not even sure it's a full size classroom. So we're bumping into um, we're bumping into some class space issues at Francis Wyman. Um, as well, if people want to keep classes around 18, then we're going to, you know, we have about 16 classrooms a grade. We can usually, we can find a 17th if needed, but not in multiple grades. So if we ever needed six sections in more than one grade, of Francis Wyman, I'm not sure where we would um, put it. Just for your lady's identification, I think it came in a little bit late. We had this discussion at the beginning of the night yes. with some Fox Hill parents up here. Yes. yes, we know. So there was <laughs> there was discussion, and it's it's an ongoing issue that we're going to have to keep looking at. And it's a it's a matter of available space and then available um, people to uh, 
teaching the classes. Right. I do understand. I, I do understand what you're saying. It just seems though that the um, rising third graders at Francis Wyman it, it is the highest at 106. And also, I think if you look at the grade three um, at the other three schools, it just doesn't seem equitable to have. 49 students with three teachers, and then 106 students with five teachers. It seems that, um, it just it, looking at the numbers here on paper, it just doesn't seem equitable. <clears throat> and it also, I think, will, um, we have had a sixth class for the last three years. So I think um, it will have an impact on our students um, because also this number, this I know it's, projected and um, but what if there are more enrollments in the summertime and then those numbers go up to 23, 24. Yeah, that's um, always a possibility and we've had that happen before that we've had to go to town meeting in September because of that. So I mean it's, it's something I'm, I'm sure that we're going to have to keep an eye on. Um, I'm a, a public school teacher of 17 years so I can attest to the, the, the benefits of having um, small class sizes. I'm not an elementary teacher, but I do understand that third grade is a, is a pivotal year for kids. It's crucial. And I just don't agree with cutting this sixth, um, sixth third grade class at this point. I don't know if it's appropriate. Um, we know it's a big year for students. It's an MCAS year. Um, I think that there's a lot, of, a lot of kids that are still trying to um, nail down the, the bent, um, benefits of or nail down how to read and all the yeah. um, basic math concepts and in a larger class what kind of attention are they going to be getting um, especially those struggling students and um, you know we, we don't want their teachers to be stretched too thin and we feel that our our children deserve a high quality of education and just because they happen to be in a grade with a large population of students we don't want them to be at a disadvantage so I, I would thank you for um, speaking publicly about this because I think it's important that anyone watching um, the Ways and Means Committee, uh, you know, I think in general it's, it's good to bring awareness to the fact that this is happening. It's happening right now in two schools. Our enrollments are growing, as um, Dr. Conti mentioned, uh, I guess last night we have a hunt approximately 130 more students now than we had a year ago um, throughout the system but that number you know every year we, we get more kids and the, the demographics are changing houses being torn down and built and families are moving in so um, we hear you uh, the superintendent will do everything he can to do the best that he can within the confines of budget and space um, and what we determined earlier at, at, when we talked with the Fox Hill parents is that um, over the next few weeks he would come up with, you know, what he can. That doesn't mean it'll change. Um, we'll see. You know, but we, we really do get it. And okay. we um, understand that you care a lot and we care a lot too. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Is there anything else? Okay. Um, we have need for executive session? No. No. We have no need for executive session. Therefore, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. We agree on that. It's three to zero. <laughs> <laughs>